Alrighty guys, a while back I did the uh, Zach Sang, Zach Sang, Zach Sang Ren, Ren Inter, God damn I can't talk, uh, Zach Sang Ren Interview, um, and now we are doing the Knox Hill Ren Interview from about a year ago, and then there's another one from six months ago, but this is the one from a year ago. Uh, I don't really watch, uh, Knox Hill's channel that much, you know, not, n no diss or any, I don't want him to fucking diss me, dude, he's got some brutal disses, um, but I don't really follow his channel much, I've done a bunch of Ren reactions, I've got a, some Ren on my playlist now, consequently, uh, but I'm just here to react to an interview, so let's get right into it. What's going on, YouTube? It's one only Knox Hill, and I have a very, very special guest here today, the traveling Shakespearean MC Bard. It is none other than the man, the myth, the legend, Ren himself. Ren, how are you doing today, man? I feel humbled by that introduction, man. The travel, I like the traveling bard. I think that's a good one. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing all right. I'm, um, I was, I was going to say like a, qu a quick disclaimer. I've, I've, I've put, been put on some new meds, which is just a short cycle. So my brain is a little bit foggier than usual. So I might have to sit and really think about things. And if things come, okay. come out a little bit jumbled, that's why I'm not just an idiot. Although partly that as well. <laughs> Hey, listen, somehow uh, people watch us, people follow us. I feel like yeah. I'm an idiot every single day when I turn the camera on, but it, uh, it is what it is. Yeah, hey, man. <laughs> so if you watch the channel, you know, yeah, see, yeah, I, I think that might be a universal thing, man. First and foremost, right? I have stuck in my head right now. Boom, and I just kind of want to jump into okay. with concepts like that, right? Mm. Animal flow. Mm. You have some Orwellian shit going on. You have some higher level concepts going on. You've got really cool things kicking to the production with the animal sounds. I've been informed that you have actually watched my reaction to your video, which is kind of wild. And yeah, I think you've watched like the whole damn thing. So that's yeah. crazy. But one thing I want to get into is what is the starting point? Is it concept first? Is it you have an idea for a melody or something going on with the production? Is it you just kind of start writing and then you start to let the lyricism guide you? Like where is where is the origin story for conceptual songs like this and tracks? Because you can do it all. You know, it's not like you're just rapping. You can sing. You do the instrumentation yourself. You do the producing. So I'm curious which hat comes on first. So mm. f first, it's kind of great first question, by the way. Like taking a bird's eye view. It's like... At the top is the overarch overarching concept of what I want yeah. to achieve with that album or that particular thing. And a big thing, a big part of it for me was um, was realizing and looking at countercultures, right? So we had the Summer of Love, you had the punk movement, you had the hip hop movement, yeah. which is a big part of the civil rights movement. You had the rave scene over in England, which was kind of like on the tail end of a depression and Thatcherism and stuff like that. And people just wanting to feel connected. And I, I Well, I, I do... I don't know that hip hop was really connected to the civil the civil rights. I mean, I, you could argue the civil rights movement is still happening, but the dates are a little bit disconnected there. Uh, I mean, hip hop didn't really start to really get cracked. You, you could argue as as soon as like the late seventies. I mean, you could make arguments for even before that, but hip hop really wasn't. But I, I'll 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 let him talk because I'm interested to hear like where he goes with it on a grand scale. But just like a smaller point, I don't believe there's much of any connection connection to the civil rights movement and hip hop. Uh, I, I you could argue N.W.A. like fighting against pol police brutality. Maybe that's kind of where he's getting it from. Uh, and and I mean a lot of rap lyrics are civil rights ish in a way, but there there wasn't like a like, I mean, the civil rights movement was primarily in the 60s and some of the 70s. And then, um, I mean, that's, you know, by that time, a bunch of people, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., rest in peace, um, a, a shitload. COINTELPRO was going on. And so a lot of these people were whacked by that time. But I, there, I don't need to be banging on about this. Let's just keep going. On the tail end of a depression and Thatcherism and stuff like that and people just wanting to feel connected. And I, I think what yeah. I found very bizarre is since the rave scene, as far as I can, I'm aware, there wasn't a, a such a strong unified counterculture as such, which is strange because we've lived as people of the world we've lived through so much weirdness in the past decade mm. particularly crazy things but the, the advancement of technology is crazy but then living through a pandemic living through 
uh, what I can see if I step out is a little bit more hyperpolarization. And I always found it was quite strange. And I was like, why? why? Like, what, what, what is it? Is it that we're now so interconnected that it's gone the other way that makes counterculture more difficult to achieve? I don't think that's the case. So I suppose my what I really wanted to achieve in an overarching theme was contributing. If if I'm if I'm lacking it in music and I'm and I'm and I'm craving it, then it's like wow, I'll just start doing it then. Because yeah. uh, and, yeah. and 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 so so for me that was it was a really important part of the overarching concept. And then when it comes down to like an ev individual song, um, it, it, with with that sentiment in mind, it's just different every time. With that song, it just started with a tom drum. I was just I just got in the studio. I had this tom drum yeah. and I was like record that and so I was working with this, this guy Aled at the time this sound engineer and, and I was just like oh let's put that down and we, we recorded that and then that was just the foundation and then everything grew from that you know like messing around with bass sounds and just manipulating them and messing them up and then um uh, I can't even remember the name of the song now. There was this hap there was this hardcore dance tune back in the nineties. It was like boom da. I think it's literally called like boom da or something like that. And it had this like doom 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 beat, and it's like boom da ba da boom ba da da. And it's got this spoken. And I just thought it was so cool. So I was like, you know what? I want to do a chorus like that, where it's like it's not quite beatboxing, but it's also not quite rapping. It's just like melodic talking. Um, so yeah. we, so so we had that idea for the hook, and then and then it just kind of grew from there. And, and what I like to do lyrically is just flow find the concept the seed of the idea and then make sure that all the lyrics fit yeah. that theme uh, and, and this one was yeah. just it, it was just this sort of animalistic jungle theme and um yeah. it wasn't actually tied to all well until we started wow. putting the video yeah. together actually right yeah so per, i don't well sorry to cut it off but this is going to be a long form thing anyway but that's something i've realized too is when i try to like when i listen to a beat and then i try to just write the lyrics it's harder to find that flow and so i've i've kind of figured that out too is that it's it's much easier to find uh different flow patterns that sound really nice and then once you have that flow pattern you can fill in the words like when you know exactly where those syllables need to hit for it to sound good then you can fill in the words afterwards that that's interesting but i'm curious what Knox has to say about that really that's really interesting because i i always pictured that you had elements of Orwell in your head because of Animal Farm. Mm. Uh, like like you had the Seven Commandments and everything throughout the visuals, but I just thought it just made so much sense. So that's pretty dope that you kind of retroactively went back yeah. and then inserted that to fit with that vibe. Because yeah, if you, if you look at the lyricism itself, you're right, like the way that you wrote, I've done Money Game uh, Part 1 and 2, so I know like when you want to get like really in depth on issues, you can get in depth. But yeah. it definitely felt like here was more metaphorical, symbolic stuff, not necessarily getting in depth. So therefore it sets up exactly exactly because some some songs you you just get very very matter of fact about it and, and like money yeah. game as well it, it kind of just breaks it down as to what what it is it, whereas something like this is a bit more ambiguous and it can be taken on surface yeah. level and if it's taken on surface level it's just like flexing basically and it's just like i'm yeah. the king of the jungle and stuff like that and then you can dig a little bit deeper into it and, and and i think one of my favorite things about art is and one of my favorite things about watching reaction videos like yourself or anyone's reaction videos is or no trash tolerated reactions it it makes somebody put their own meaning on what it is and even if that wasn't yeah. necessarily your intent it, it creates yeah. a conversation it creates a thought and i think that's the beautiful thing is that like um it, i always thought modern art was shit and and until i started thinking like <laughs> until i started thinking about the perspective like you could walk into a room and there's just a chair and you're like what the hell is that chair doing there <laughs> like come yeah. on why has this person been given a lot of money for this and then but but then that's not really that's not really the point it's the, the point is the observe <laughs> sorry i'm sorry man just give me a sec what is the observer <laughs> yeah. thinking even my reaction of going that's crap is in a reaction and it's like yeah, and that, yeah. i guess that's the point it's like things are only really as valuable as the value that we give them as people like even even with yeah. money it's all arbitrary it's all comes from our ideas at the end of the day so what however we value something is just a decision at the end of the day and the same same is true with art so somebody could look at those lyrics and go for animal flow and go just it's just this fucking this white dude flexing about being good. or someone could look yeah. at it and go actually this this has a deeper meaning about society and counterculture and and both are true <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the beautiful thing yeah. yeah well i mean you talk about objective reality versus subjective reality and i think you hit on a very good point there especially with music and art in general and like you know i get into arguments i get into discussions on this channel all the time about stuff and people want to try to objectify music but to me 
you know, it, music is whatever you take away from it. And I completely agree with that. Like when I've written songs and like I see a reactor have a different interpretation to it, that doesn't mean that that interpretation is invalid. No, 100%. You know what I mean? Like, like if that's how they connect with it and mm. that's their emotional connection and that's what that song gives them, yeah. then yeah, you know, we all kind of write in that way. And, and you know, writing mm. language and the poetry of music is different from everyday conversational language, you know? 100%. So that's the beauty of the poetry of music is that it can be. I will say the best poetry is no different than conversational language. Uh, that's kind of, may, might be a, a conversation for a different day, but I will say that, uh, in my opinion, the best poetry, the most um, impactful poetry sounds conversational. It doesn't sound super manufactured. It doesn't sound um, engineered. Uh, that's my opinion, but that's, that's kind of what they're talking about is the sub subjectivity of like, you know, somebody else, the thing that's most impactful to them might be the engineering uh, of, of syllables and words and that multisyllabic slant. Um, uh, we'll, we'll keep going here, man. I have so many different thoughts because I've, I've just started to kind of write. I, I've been kind of writing raps for a while and listening to a lot of rap um, for, since I was young, actually. And I always liked poetry, but now I'm starting to right and i'm really gaining an appreciation for the process and being able to create a, a song that sounds good uh it's a lot harder than people realize everyday conversational language you know 100%. so that's the beauty of the poetry of music is that it can be interpreted in so many ways mm. and you know mm. it sounds to me like especially with you the more i'm starting to do your discography the more i'm starting to learn that there is definitely a, a a wide spectrum of sort of topics that you like to dive into and discuss it's not just flexing bars or flexing tracks oh, like yeah. you get a lot of mcs do you like your political commentary you like you your societal commentary you storytell as well so how do you organize all this chaos in your head because it seems like there's a lot of shit going on up here creatively man <laughs> like ah <laughs> uh, uh <laughs> i don't really well i, I think that's that's why uh, as well stylistically this album was a bit of a challenge for me because of everything that i've put together before that that's like been a body of work has been quite eclectic in terms of the the genres and styles because um yeah yeah that may have something to do with adhd it may just be the way that my brain works you know because i think that everyone's on some sort of spectrum with these things um yeah. so yeah in terms of organizing it it's, it's really just finding it's just finding that theme and once i found the theme i can roll with it and and i, I think the, the the thing for me at the moment is is because i've been it, it, it's it's difficult to everyone just wants to put you into a box and so when you write something quite yeah. poignant and take your time really writing something poignant this is this is just me very very straightforward about this like so when i wrote high run i wrote high run after this whole album uh, so and i've been sitting on these tracks for n almost a year basically we i actually finished recording animal flow last year uh a year and a half ago now actually but like so i've just been wow. sitting on this for a while so it, it's funny because then you sort of evolve as an artist and and and, and, I, and I put high run out and i was like these because it was so i suppose it, it related and touched the nerve with so many people and i put so much effort into making sure each line was really meticulously planned through something like animal flow just being honest i didn't really do that i just wrote it for fun i was just like this is this is yeah. this is f something fun to do and then people people try to look for poignancy because they expect it you know what i mean so it's like it's yeah. almost it's almost this case of like imposter syndrome in a way because you're like I, but 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 then I was trying to step, and I, I was talking about this to my mate, mate Tarek. I was like, "Yeah, I just, I'm, I'm just not. I, I just almost want to scrap everything I've done and just start writing things that are on the same caliber as that because that's what people came. A, a lot of people have come to find my work through, and and um, he was just like, "Mate, you're being stupid because like even if unintentional, there are still things that are coming through that that yeah. that, that, that 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 could." you know mean stuff to people and so uh, yeah i need to just kind of get over my perfectionism with this i think yeah yeah mm. well again you talk about intention versus interpretation but also not to discredit yourself i mean you still had to throw like the seven fucking commandments in there you had to throw in all these little easter eggs and stuff yeah, but, visually so there's so, still that poignancy well, this, this, even though even even though you might discredit some of the the song itself and then it's not hard to make those connections from the different animal themes throughout and those metaphors so to what you did, you well, know what I mean? That's the thing. Like, so, so I, I, for me personally, like finishing the song is fifty percent of the song, and then, and then the video, yeah. the video, because I, I, I'm always putting together uh, and directing these videos, and then Sam is just a genius. I mean, it was actually Luke on this one, but I, I usually work with Sam. But Luke, the same thing, just very, very clever at 
I just I tell them my ideas and they they bring it to life yeah. very very well yeah. and um but yeah I mean the video for this one that's where I started getting really excited because there's so much we hid in that video just just like yeah. little little things and the more you start coming up with one thing then it just excites you to like go, oh what else can we do and with those one yeah. takes particularly because it's like how much can we pack into this little journey yeah. this little visual journey yeah I think too like you know, it, it's interesting because obviously I'm not just a reactor, I'm an artist too. So I get to see things from my perspective and then relate them to you. Like even when I'm doing songs, for instance, that let's call them like more shallow type of songs, right? They're yeah. just more like, let's just have fun with it. I write them a lot quicker than I do some of these like storytelling songs, some yeah. of these deeper songs. Yeah. But I still like operate under kind of the premise, like if I'm going to make an entertaining song, I'm still going to try to do it in a different way than how the mainstream is flooding it with you know what i mean like even though you had let's call it yeah you had fun with it it's a party song like you still beatbox in it you still found all these animal noises you still said you did something creatively mm. that is still different to what the normal palette is consuming along the same subject lines along the same subject matter if yeah, that makes yeah. Sense. yeah and i, I just lo i just love doing that as well i mean it's just and, and that's the thing like people are we're not just serious all the time. We're not introspective all the time. Sometimes we're just with our mates joking and having fun. And I feel like, because yeah. sometimes you read comments, you probably got the same thing. Just like, oh, well, this doesn't, this isn't quite like that one. And it's like, yeah, but yeah. of course it's not. Because like, we are yeah. such a, like, a rich tapestry of different things. That's what makes us people. And I feel like music should be allowed to be that as well. You know what I mean? Like if I want to yeah. do, if I want to do a heavy metal song next week, Fuck it, why not? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like screaming yeah, down the mountain. Like, do it. Because, because it, it's true to that moment. And it's, and it's like, yeah, I, I just, and that's why I think, that's why when I was thinking about it more, I'm like, no, I just need to get over this. Like, I need to get over this, like want for everything to have to hit yeah. on this like huge, oh my God. Wow, it, it is fascinating to see how much of an internal, um, and I, I, don't, I don't know if most artists have this, but I mean, I, I, I have it, but it's interesting to see that Ren has like so much internal conflict with himself as it pertains to how to make his music or should he do this or should he do that? Um, and, and I'm, I'm starting to have that same, like, it, it, and that's good because it puts thought behind the art. Um, but it is interesting to see like that, that internal thought process and, and sometimes external when he's consulting people, um, where he's like, should I do this? Should I do that? And then it, it's, it's definitely good to bounce it off of other people because other people, especially if they disagree with you, um, you don't want somebody who disagrees with you every single time you say something. That's a toxic person. But somebody who, who can digest what you're saying and give you objective uh, responses to that, and especially if they disagree with – like you don't want people who just like kiss your ass and tell you everything's great all the time. Um, but it is interesting to see like Ren's internal process that, that goes in, and I wonder if that's – across the board with all artists or some artists or certain types of artists who make certain types of music i don't know or like if their musical background is starting from i started by playing an instrument and then i got into writing lyrics and vocals um as opposed to uh like somebody who starts to rap and then starts to learn an instrument later uh let's just keep going here guys god what did i just watch level i was just like nah that nothing like life isn't like that life isn't full of these no. just like moments after moments after moments of big moments it's just like they're they're weaving in in between all these so it's like yeah fuck it if i want to do something fun and do something fun yeah I've, i find too like the second someone tries to put me in a certain box i'm like okay fuck it i'll go all the way over here and swerve <laughs> yeah, yeah, in this yeah. direction just to show you that you i'm not going to be boxed in and you're right life life is a spectrum is man these are two little kanye west's dude um yeah, no, in this, yeah, I, I'm kind of in the same way. And even with reactions, like, I mean, some people might even take issue with me s disagreeing with these two human beings on certain aspects of music. And I'm, you know, I'm sure I have a lot to learn, but like, um, I mean, yeah, there is this thing where like when people try to put you in a box, like, I don't know if that's the artist, the rebelliousness, maybe, I, I don't know if it's psychological with your family, how you grew up or what, but I definitely have it where I'm like, if I'm doing something and it starts to get too consistent and then I feel like it's just like, no, I can't be like the that guy or like that person. And then I have to like I almost have to deviate just because people might 
expect something of me, but I, I'll let these guys talk. Isn't it? Like we all have moments when we're down, when we have our dark places, we have moments in our highs and our joys and everything. So, yeah. you know, why not be versatile with the music that you put out to reflect all those different aspects of life and just being human? Yeah, and it, and it keeps it exciting yeah. as well. It keeps music exciting. If you, I, I've never, my, my philosophy with this is I never want to go, oh no, I've got to go and make a song. I never ever want to feel like that. I always want to feel like, mm. it's like, I feel like I put in the cheat code in life now because like people, I've made this a career somehow. And like, I love, I love that because creativity, no matter if it's music, film, whatever it is, but I just love creating something new out of everything that already exists. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Speaking of uh, creativity, I've got a question for you. Okay. In terms of your writing process, do you ever step back and think about how this will be digested or consumed like 10 years from now 20 years from now like do you do you write in a way to try to make it timeless or do you feel like timelessness will just come naturally through the art itself if that makes sense. <laughs> i think I knox has some good questions man i think so the only the only time that that's really on my spectrum of awareness because i try not to think too much in the future during the creative process yeah. because I, d I try i almost don't want to uh, taint it too much by a by a an, an outcome. I don't want it to be mm -hmm. outcome dependent. I don't want to be like this song is going to be a hit. I, I don't I don't ever really want to feel like that. And I, I and I want to feel like everything in the moment that I'm creating is my favorite thing that I've done in that moment. Um, yeah. Like otherwise, it, there's no point in it existing for me anyway. But like, but in terms of that, the only time I've really thought of that are, are during more sung songs like ballads or stuff like that because I just feel like there's something about a sung ballad that you can just go back like when i go back and listen to like oh it's redding or like or like these old uh, james wow. songs or like it's just like you can listen to that it's like it's like amy winehouse will be timeless it's like and i know real and, and they also sit across a lot of tastes like because a lot mm. of people could be like hardcore hip-hop purists and then listen to like a bill withers and just be like god man this is so good you know what i mean yeah. like and, and for me when yeah. It, yeah, it's when I'm approaching songs like that. That's the only time it really comes into my head. Like, oh, I really want to make something that someone could listen to, maybe twenty years down the line. I don't, I don't tend to do it so much with with my hip hop stuff, but who knows? Like, you you never really know what what that will be because maybe when they were doing the old soul sort of stuff started popping off and that scene started happening with all the greats back then, they 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 thought it was very new and exciting that people wouldn't be listening back in years yeah. to come. But well, that's we true. I, I guess yeah. the thing is, like, I, I think about it sometimes, right? Like especially if I'm dropping like a lot of specific like current day events or references. I, I don't know. It just, it just depends on, on the song yeah. itself. But with rap, we say so much more in our words, don't we? Like we just have so much more opportunities for lyricism yeah. and rap is rap is current. You know, rap is about oftentimes the bubble in, in the here and now. So I think it's kind of more yeah. difficult versus a, a ballad mm. like you discussed to, to write sort of lyricism. That's more emotive. That's more timeless in that sense that anyone can connect to. Cause we get a lot more specific but also we get a lot more opportunities to talk about specific shit too, I guess. Yeah, but then, but then yeah, and, and, and I, so I suppose it's, yeah, it's just a way of stepping yourself because I, I think I, the, what I love about hip hop is that you can cram so much story into such a small amount of space. Mm -hmm. That's that's one of my favorite yeah. things about it is like, and also just the wordplay, like I'm in love with, it made me fall in love with the English language. I wasn't so much into English when I was in school, but then when I started writing more, I'm just like, I love English. Like, like, I love what you can do with wordplay and metaphors and similes. And, oh, yeah. I mean, you're, you're that that's sorry. Yeah. Sorry to cut you off, Knox. Um, yeah, that, that's always been my attraction to it. Uh, was the wordplay and, and the, uh, y you know, the sounds that you can use, manipulate and, uh, pair together to, uh, to give an overall sound. Uh, that was that was always my draw. Um, and when I tell people I'm into rap, usually I get this initial look of like because they kind of think like, oh, you know, he listens to like probably Suicide Boys or I don't know, Nicki Minaj or something. I don't know, like like Cardi B, like the, the popular stuff that people hear. Um, and and then I kind of have to explain if it even gets to that point in the conversation. I usually explain like, no, like I. I I really like rap, rapping. Like I, I really love it. Um, and that's the draw to me. Like the beats are cool. There's instrumentation. There's there's production, things that I like. But to me, the spoken word is the thing that always drew me to it. Very poetic. Like you know, you talk about like internals, the external rhymes, the way that you set up your structures, the way mm. you think about 
how you word and stress your syllables and unstressed things. I see a lot of poetry within within yeah. your lyricism. Yeah, and, and, and that's, right. well, that's what I love about more of the fun songs as well is that you can, you start to dissect internal rhyme schemes within schemes and then like, be yeah. like, you set yourself a challenge of, right, right, I'll write the third word of this line with the third word of the third line and then the third word of the sixth line and then you'll, you'll do it, which, most like you, you get most of it and but like the everyday person they they just know that it feels good they're not yeah, they're not yeah, like yeah. mathematically dissecting that and going this is why it feels good they just know that it something's happening <laughs> it's like yeah. keeping the flow time long but i love that challenge Something of like cohesive. being able because the challenge is you you see that you see it almost like a mathematical or color coded thing but then the challenge is how can i do this and also make it make sense within the context of the subject matter that's but i love that i love the challenge man yeah yeah speak all right so speaking of rap here, here's my question right on this side of the spectrum you got white boy from an all black area like yeah. i had no choice with hip-hop like hip-hop was was coming whether i wanted to or not yeah right how does a white boy out of wales become such a cold-hearted MC? Like, where does this passion and drive for rap come into play, man? It was just, it was just me. It was just kind of leaking into my house from, and I also think that, um, and it's why like lyrically, I don't, I don't try in front and put on a, a place that I've never come from in my music either. Yeah. But like, it, it, it's, but I, it was still, it's still fucking, it still wasn't an easy upbringing, man. Like, you know, we, 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 I came, came from working class home, mum and dad separated. Um, and like, and I think one, one thing about hip hop as well that I like is, is it's kind of like fearlessness in the face of adversity. That's it. Yep. That's it for me. And, and, yeah. and which transcends adversity can come in any shape or form or any sort of size. Oh, yeah. and, and, and I definitely experienced a lot more of it from my 19 until I was about 30 but like I don't know it was just more like when I when I was young man I sorry I'm gonna cut people off but this is kind of I'm doing a reaction so that's how it goes but um for me some of the best hip-hop reaches beyond like it, it resonates with people who uh you know come from working class or poor environments and I think that's why it does stretch across um racial and and some cultural boundaries is because um, well, there, there is an interesting fascination with this white suburban population being into to rap, which I think that's that's a longer conversation for a different day. But ultimately, it does uh, some of the best hip hop does paint the picture of, of a struggle, like you said, a struggle of, of overcoming and being fearless in the face of adversity. And to me, the best hip hop relates on a on a human struggle level. Um, the same with any message, in my opinion, like if you're trying to if you're a public speaker or a motivational speaker or, or whatever it is, if you can relate to that common human struggle that everybody will have no matter what where you're from um, and you can you can communicate that in a way that resonates, you know, that's going to eventually stretch across barriers. Um, but I'll, I'll let uh, Ren keep going here. I was about 30, but like, I don't know, it was just more like. When I when I was younger and and I heard like like Method Man and and the Dre 2001 album, there was just something that instantly clicked. I was just like I just instantly liked it. Uh, uh, and yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rage Against the Machine as well to get well, more and oh, move more into yeah. sort of political. Like Zach Zach De La Rocha's, I think he never really makes the top ten list of anybody's, but he's definitely in mine, man. He's he's such a fucking he's such a good MC. But um, yeah, it, it was just like it just whatever it was about it. I think it was like the frustration or just like that that feel of like being empowered and standing up to yeah. a feeling of frustration or discontentment with your surroundings and um it's that it's that renegade spirit yeah that, that rap has always had and i get that renegade spirit from you and your lyrics i mean look there's a reason why it's one of the number one selling genres in the world because you know everybody goes through struggles and mm. and like you said coming from working class parents split I mean, odds are already against you in the first place. Mm. And and rap is like spitting in that face of adversity, isn't it? And then yeah. obviously all of your health issues and all the other shit that you've been through. Yeah. So, I mean, all right. So so you start listening to rap, right? You start getting into method. You start getting into M. You start getting into rage. But 
there's listening to it, right? And then there's doing it. So so at what point in your musical arc do you all of a sudden go, yo, I'm gonna start fucking rapping. Like this is this is my thing now. It was it, it was necessity, right? Because I started I started producing music when I was really young. I started producing when I was 12. I was just like, this is, I, when I was like from 10 until then, I, I just, I used to carry this little tiny guitar with me. Just like, it was like a little beaten up little thing that my dad gave me and I was like it would come everywhere I went and then like at one point I was just like I, I need to make beats because I saw I went, my, yeah. my parents were like massive hippies and they took me to this like these these festivals every um summer with beautiful things yeah. man where just it was just like full of loads of really open-minded people and um but there, there would be like this rave night where they would play drum and bass. The dr- I don't know how much you're into drum and bass scene, but here like jungle and drum and bass in the UK where you yeah, are. Yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge. I huge. tell you, not, not necessarily uh, full on like drum and bass, but like UK hip hop, the first really got me interested on that side of things. Have you heard of Mike Skinner in the streets? Yeah, like, of course, man. Mike Skinner, bro, that, that, the, the, um, uh, orig- Damn, I feel bad. I haven't. Original pirate material for me was Fuck yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was one of my favorite albums growing up. I, I'd I'd actually say that that was probably just as influential as like the Marshall Mathers LP um, in terms of getting into and and Andre two thousand and one in terms of getting the the beats and the the lyricism on it. Like like Mike Skinner, I think is a genius. And what I loved about him is there was no. He was what he was. He was a geezer, mate, from from the from the East End, whatever. I, I actually have things from up north, maybe. But but what the the, the his his uh, the way he was putting it out there was just like it was just so it wasn't anything other than him and it was like relatable because yeah. he's talking about going to a pub on a friday night chatting up birds ending up in the kebab shop at four in the morning talks about like being like 45th generation roman and i'm like yeah. what, what the fuck kind of bars are we dropping it's, here man it's like, so it's so hmm. british and that's what i loved i was like you don't have to i don't have to be anything other than what i am right now in this yep. and and, and, that, and that was like a quite an enabling thing and um so yeah anyway i got into that i started producing and i was like oh I need to find an MC because like I can't do it. But, but I'm 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 a, like a little kid. I'm a 12 year old kid in Wales. Yeah. Like no one's uh, other than like the GLC. Not not I don't know if you ever heard of GLC, but like not many rap artists came out of Wales, and um and I couldn't find anyone to do it. So I just started doing it myself, and oh, I, I, I was very bad at the start, and and I just it was just kind of like persistence, and uh, I I just keep on doing it and doing it and doing it, and then. You know, like you've probably done the same thing. You know, like you'll be in your mate's car and you put on an instrumental and you're just freestyling for fun. Yep. I did it yep. so many times. Like that, that's what All we'd be time. doing. We'd just be driving around or you go into a party and there'd be someone and you'd have like rap battles and you'd be like 13, yep. 13 years old at the time. So probably yep. bad, but all your boys are hyping you up and they're like, oh, that's a bird. And, and you're, you just, you're and you're fucking get, awful. Yeah. You're fucking awful. But, 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 and that's what we... <laughs> Yeah, dude, we would do the lunch table where somebody would get a like two pencils or one pencil and they would make a beat with uh, this was the kick and then the hi-hat and the snare was clapping the pencil on the table. We would do lunch table ciphers. Um, yeah, I mean, different battles and stuff, man. Good old days. We used to do, you know, we'd all like sit in a circle and just freestyle about everyone. And, and that's yep. kind of, I just love that part of the, the culture of it. It was just like mm. expression. And then you just... And and then with time it just gets easier and you you become better and you start looking into why flow sound good and and you start dissecting people like Method who just like rhythmically just bouncing on a beat and you're like okay what's going on here like why do I like this yeah. and and then trying See, to we're, we're we're from a similar era so like during that time as we're growing up remember when Eight Mile came out and obviously Eminem's huge and then everybody was about that battle rap culture and <laughs> yeah, yeah. that just really brought shit on didn't it everybody wanted to freestyle wanted to battle rap and it just accelerated from there yeah yeah but no i yeah i, I, I that was that was really it man and, and and like it was just so i just found it so fun that was it yeah 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 at at, at what point after so now you're doing it right now we're walking through it we're getting to the origin story here of of the MC known as Ren um when did you realize like I'm pretty damn good at this? Like I'm I, I'm gonna lay I'm gonna lay down my own vocals on these tracks now. I don't I don't need a rapper anymore. I don't need to go get someone. I even when I was laying down my own vocals on my track, it like, was just like I was just so determined. So like I'd I'd have these CDs, and this is when I, I sold my I made my first album when I was thirteen. I think I was called I was called Syndicate 
because like, I've always had this kind of like county counter culture thing, but I was called Cinder. Yeah. There, there was a game called Syndicate. I don't know if you ever played it. It was like Command yeah. and Conquer style game. It was sick. It was sick. But anyway, I, was, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, called, I called myself Syndicate and, and um, no shit. I, I, had, I had this little CD of beats that I'd make. Some of it would be like drum and bass. Some of it um, would be hip hop beats. And it would just like be like this little, I was really inspired by the Prodigy back then as well. So a lot of it was quite that sort of like breakbeat mm. inspired. And because at the time, like you know we are old men my friend we allowed that the internet wasn't really a thing so i was literally walking th around these these festivals with a boom box mm -hmm. putting the cd in and i would sit down and i would like make them listen to it i'd be like this is my this is my album that'll be 10 quid please that's 10 pounds <laughs> yep. and and, uh, and, and, I, and i just like try and, and if, if i sold like four or five in a day for a 13 year old that's like crazy money so i'm like i am balling yeah. i've got my 40 pounds i'm off to the shop i'm buying i'm stocking up on these sweeties man and um so yeah so that, that that was it was really just like i don't know in terms of like I, I think i was quite disconnected as to good or bad it was just more just like obsession and i had to do it, it mm. so I, so it wasn't really like i'm the shit listen to this it wasn't really like that i was just like i'm proud of this listen to this do you know what i mean yeah yeah, well, you were you were doing it all, but man, I mean, we we are getting old, aren't we? The the CD days. I remember having having the trunk, man. Right, mm -hmm. we had the trunk, we had the CDs in the trunk. We popped the trunk open. We had the system playing out of the trunk. We had our own songs playing, or sometimes we put on the beats and we'd just be sat there on the corner, just rapping to the beats, like, "Yo, yeah. this is us," just holding up the CD, and that was that was the self promotion, man. That's the hustle, was, mate. Yeah. That's the hustle. That was that was the hustle. All right, so mm. speaking of the hustle, right? So you're promoting yourself, you're going around festivals. I don't know how old these do. I mean, Ren always looks like he's like 16 or 18 to me. Uh, I don't know, but based on how they're talking, I'm guessing they're like at least 30, maybe 35 or something tops. Uh, maybe even like, I, I'm 28. Um, and so like I, I was in, I mean, even during high school, like it was when iPhones were really starting to get pushed out into like, like high school. So I, there was like a point in middle school and then early high school where like iPhones weren't really there yet. And then by the time I finished high school, everyone had an iPhone. Um, and so I, I do get like a little bit of what they're talking about um, before. I mean, we had the internet by the time I was in high school, but uh, it wasn't. It wasn't also nearly as big of a thing. It wasn't as integral to every part of existent human existence as it seems to be now. Um, Where is the next step? Because I saw somewhere that uh, you were signed by Sony, weren't you? So it, the next, it really came from. Um, and, that, and that's when you were younger too. I mean, so we're you know I'm 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 getting the timeline. So this was before I got this was before my illness started happening, but um. I was, yeah, I was about 18 or 19, um, and I was busking. Uh, oh, by the way, t-shirts are available for purchase. Let's keep going. Because I started, but I was like, I, I wasn't I wasn't really making enough money to live, but I, I the, the first and only job that I got was in um, a, su a supermarket in co-op. And um, I got, um, I got- Fucking co-op. Yeah. That's I, like, that's, that's like Walmart or 7-Eleven for my American audience. There we go. Yeah, but I was, I was a delinquent back then. And I used to come in like on a Sunday morning, just like super hungover, just like in a different world. And then like, I would just be, and, and they, they noticed that I wasn't working very well. And they also had CCTV footage of me throwing sprouts at my other mate who was working there. They pulled me in <laughs> and they sat me down and they were like, What's this? And then anyway, so so I I I I didn't carry on with that job. Uh, I got politely asked to leave. And then um I, and then I was just like I don't want to I don't want to have to do I want I want to do music forever. Like this is what I want to do. So oh, I was yeah. like I was I was so determined to make it work that I was like I'm gonna go busking. And, and when I started, it was it was quite a daunting thing, but um it it really helped me with my performance because at the start you, you I, I I just people observe a lot. So when I'd be playing, I'd be um. Just, just kind of watching people and trying to improve mm. how I'm interacting with people to to kind of improve my performance, and it it, yeah. so it turned from a fear into a love. Like I became so obsessed with it, like I couldn't wait to get out onto the streets. And um, it was it was then really like I, I I'd sing a lot of my own songs that I wrote, and um, yeah, even even back then I think a lot of my lyrics had this kind of feeling of counterculture to them. Um, because it was yeah. always it was always something that was quite drilled into me. I suppose because I grew up li reading a lot of 
Al- Aldous Huxley, George Orwell, Kurt Vonnegut, um, j- just a lot of listening to Rage Against the Machine. Listening and the to Mike Rage Skinner's Against the, the Machine, going to get counterculture, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. And and it was just a big. Um, but I think beyond that, it was it was more just like this awareness and ability to stand back and and uh, I, I guess to people watching and and to notice. Uh, I don't know, uh, trying to notice where people fall short and then also realizing within noticing that I'm being hypocritical because I, uh, I'm, I'm guilty of the same things. And uh, within that I birthed a lot of my lyrics about this kind of complex like analysis of like, shit, we could be doing this a lot better, or, but so could I, and I'm not. So like, what's, what's yeah. going on here? And, and, and uh, so, so a lot of the songs that I wrote were kind of, uh, and I was singing one of these songs called I Wish, which isn't online anywhere, but um, th- this guy Eric stopped and, and he, he'd put together Plan B, who you probably heard if you're into U- UK hip hop. Um, so he, he he just done the defamation. Oh shit. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. He, ju- he just yeah. co- he just come off the back of the success of the, the defamation of Strickland Banks was where Ben, um, ben Drew from Plan B, had, he, he started doing um, more sort of soul stuff. And they hit it with that Motown type shit when they when they wicked. swerved into that lane that just fucking took off. They put they put him in a suit. They like Ben mate Ben was hard though, but like he 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 because he came out of a proper you could tell he was just like rough London kid came out of like yeah. a rough background and I I loved this stuff man when I grew up because I found Ben way before that album came out like Charmaine and um who needs actions when you got words and all that stuff like I was I was a big mm. big 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 fan. So when Eric was like oh yeah by the way I've just come off the back of this we, we got chatting. He was like, I love your lyrics. I love to take you up to London. And we would get in the studio together. And then he told me the band thing, and I was like, I'm there. <laughs> like, I'm next next train into London, I'm going because like I was. Let's go. I, I was a big big Plan B fan. Um, I I think he's. I, I took a lot of inspiration from him because like things like the Ill Manners movie. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but um, mm. yeah, exactly. Like he's he's a visionary. He's not just a, a rapper. He he does a lot of things. He's a great actor. He does a lot of stuff. But um. So I went up to London and, and and that was kind of it. That was it was a really affirming time for me because like to get somebody it, it's it's funny because of my I, I guess quite turbulent relationship with the industry. It's funny because to have somebody working within those fields. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't really say Eric's an industry type though. He's just kind of a just a brilliant guy, sick musician. But almost to have that affirmation of someone working on very successful stuff, being like. I love your stuff. It was a massive confidence yeah. boost, and and it was like something in my mind. I was like, this is probably beyond busking on the street. If I if I lean into this enough, mm. you know. So um, yeah, that that was kind of it, really. That that was the thing that I was like, I'm, I am ready to go, and I'm going like full speed ahead. And the I suppose the the bittersweet irony was it, it was really close to as months after having that belief that I got struck down with this illness and just couldn't do anything. Like what what for for years I, I was I wasn't able to I wasn't able to get out of bed. I wasn't able to uh, my brain would be so foggy that I couldn't write, wouldn't pick up my guitar for months on end. It's just like Yeah, cuz cuz you were mis you were misdiagnosed, weren't you with uh what was it the fatigue syndrome I yeah chronic I fatigue chronic fatigue syndrome yeah 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 and then obviously late not until later on lyme disease it was it, exactly right? yeah so it took so it took you went through seven a lot years. of time of getting your whole body chemistry all fucked up and all tooled around with yeah for the wrong reasons exactly and, and that, i think that that comes across now it, it, sort, sort of the things like sick boy and stuff i think there was a lot of and even till to this day i'm trying to find a way to release it cathartically and not in a way that's uh, makes me bitter but like there was a lot of still a lot of anger for the fact that I had to take so much medication that I didn't need that had so much side effects and the, you know like and I I tolerated so much that was actually detrimental to my recovery because I, I suppose and I don't blame any individuals for this because it's not mm. like I, I, I wouldn't even blame the first nurse who just like was like oh maybe you're depressed yeah i was i was gonna ask do you think it's a, yeah. a human error or that is a systematic error that i think led i think i think it's a diagnosis i think it's a system systemic error and, and look there's well so before ren keeps going on this um i have a similar experience but it's it's with uh mental health rather than physical health um and there's this constant um there's this, you know, obviously the two play a big part in in e- each other. Um, but for me, mine was like, you know, going to a psychiatrist at like 13, um, being diagnosed with, I got like five different diagnoses. Um, 
I think 14 or 15 is when I started my first SSRI. And then through that, I mean, it ended up being more and then I would stop and change um, and all this different therapy. And then, you know, it wasn't till really the age of 22 that I had found a really good um, therapist. And uh, I, one day I, I was doing a lot better these days. And so one day I just I, I asked him after a while and it was like, Wait, so what? what is, like, if you were to diagnose me with something, what would it be? Um, and he, he, he paused and he basically said uh, a form of very intense anxiety. Um, and, and that's kind of what he, he diagnosed me as. And, you know, when I was young, I, I had, um, what was it? Seasonal affective, generalized anxiety, um, major depressive disorder. I was I was diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder, which is like, I don't know. To me, it's like, well, I was an asshole, so I don't know. Um, but you know, I had all these things, and you know, when I was thirteen, I was diagnosed with them, and and elements of them could have put part of it, and I I probably agree i'll listen to what ren has to say but i probably agree with him in that i don't necessarily blame the individual psychiatrists uh, i think they should like I, I think that as individual psychiatrists therapists um you know those are two different things um li like whatever you're doing you should be very thorough and very intentional with w when you're treating people for an illness whether it's a mental illness or a physical illness um, you should be very like, I do believe in a personal responsibility as like, like, or a doctor, like a medical doctor. Um, but I, I do think that the problem does stem from a, a more systemic issue in that, um, I, uh, I mean, for instance, a lot of the medical textbooks are a lot of the studies that are put into medical tech that are quoted in medical textbooks are paid for by, the the pharmaceutical industry um in this this big medicine industry and the same with the mental health uh industry a lot of uh the studies of how effective an ssri is uh these are paid for by the companies that make the ssri and it says oh it's this effective with this specific mental health diagnosis like depression they say x medication is good for depression um, and there oftentimes are financial incentives to prescribe SSRIs. Um, and so f for me, it, it is a lot more, it's a lot larger than like the individual doctor. And to me, it's also not enough to say, oh, it's the system. Because everyone says that kind of shit nowadays. It's like, oh, the system's so fucked up. They're trying to do this. It's like, who are they? Like, like, be, like for me we have a responsibility to be a lot more specific than just the system, like this large grand idea. It's like, what are the specific issues? And so some of the things are, are I found that pharmaceutical companies will pay for studies. And if the studies show that if say they spend like a hundred million dollars on producing this SSRI and they run an object, uh, a double blind uh, cross, whatever it's called, the double blind uh, cross. You you can look it up, but like the creme de la creme of studies in in Western science um, or in science in general. And if they run one of those and it's found that the SSRI SSRI isn't great, then the pharmaceutical company will have them redo the study and essentially what ha ends up happening is sometimes not all the time but sometimes studies are manufactured to make a medication seem effective when in fact it really isn't um or or in some cases it's actually even cause it, it even degrades the uh, original illness that it's supposed to help treat um now, this is a very complex and large issue, which is why I'm kind of going on a little bit about it here. But for me, it is very important to, to break down like people say the system or like, oh, it's oh, doctors, you can't trust doctors, you can't trust big pharma. It's like, OK, well, well like let's get more. Not that I'm not a, disagreeing with that, but let's get very specific about what we're talking about here. Um, and also what it comes down to is these companies pay billions of dollars to lobby members of Congress to to 
either relax or make in some cases make public policy legislation for things like to say that man it gets even more complicated with the affordable care act because then what you have is you have a publicly subsidized health care and in order for a doctor to accept this like to, to accept and be part of this system which is a huge cash cow they would have to say okay your child has diabetes this is the medication that we would recommend instead of saying like hey maybe we should lay off the sugar like maybe exercise this and that the primary prescription uh like per government law would be to to prescribe this medicine and like that that trickles down into the same thing you see in the mental health uh, industry and the medical industry. And if you're like, why is this dude banging on about this right now? Uh, right now? I don't give a shit. You can either skip or shut the video off. This is something that I am very passionate about because this is a real life experience that I've gone through. Um, and, and even now today, um, I've read statistics that say 25% of women in the United States of America are on an SSRI. Think about that. You're walking down the street. If four women walk past you, one of them is 100% on an SSRI. Think about how high, 25%. And that's not to target women in any way, shape, or form. So don't go crazy with it. But the point is, and, and same with men. I mean, I in my family, I have family members who in the past two years have been prescribed multiple family members, not just one, multiple who have been prescribed various medications. I was put on medication as a young kid, um, and these were for mental health disorders, and I have friends, uh, people that I know in everyday life who are constantly, they go to a therapist, and then a month or two in, they get prescribed an SSRI, and I just talked to this one friend, and I shit you not, two months later, he's now on an additional two SSRIs, and, and once again, I have nothing against SSRIs. I am, I am definitely against how they are applied and, and the, the quote therapy, the, the therapy and recovery from a mental health disorder that we exercise in the United States of America. I am very opposed to the way that it, it is practiced. Um, I know in other parts of the world, in Europe, t typically there's more of a, uh, and once again, skip ahead if this is not interesting to you, but typically in other places, there's more of an emphasis on, well, let's try to eat salad twice a week and go for a daily walk. Like, okay, somebody comes in, they were in a car crash with their best friend, their best friend dies, they come in, they're depressed, they're, they're fucked up in the head, right? Um, and if they need to prescribe an SSRI, that's assessed, and then if they do prescribe an SSRI, there is other things that accompany it aside from every two weeks or every month you come in you talk to me and then you get another prescription so you can refill your ssri like like there are two separate worlds and i so i'll stop banging on about it here but i am interested to hear what rena has to say because that's my perception of the way that mental health is handled in the states and honestly in western countries it seems like at large it's not specific to the united states of america um it seems to be a, a western thing that's happening and i'm sure in in eastern countries there's a similar maybe some kind of a similar thing depending on what you know obviously depending on where you are um but I'm going to let Ren go here because I am really curious to, to kind of hear him talk about this. Uh, but I did go off on a little bit of a, um, you know, a rabbit hole there. But I, I do believe like this is something that I do hold very fundamental. And so like this is not lip service. This is not. And it's popular now to cr criticize these things. But then when I ask people because I agree with these people, like we, we should criticize them. But oftentimes when I ask like, OK, well, like, what do you mean? Even the simple question of what do you mean, they start to stumble over their words and like they have no idea what they're even trying to say. And I'm like, well, hold on. So are you is this a belief you hold or is this something that it's just popular to say? And so now you're spouting shit off. Um, let's keep going here, guys. It, it, we haven't quite nailed it yet. The, the beauty of public health care. One hell of a rant, huh? Let's hear it for that real quick. Let's hear it for that. In England is that you can go and break your arm an ambulance will come and pick you up and you won't get billed for it 
The beauty of privatized healthcare is you will go in and because they're taking your money, they will be compassionate and they'll spend a lot of time with you until they figure out what's yeah. gone wrong. Not always, because I've heard stories of people in America that have had just as bad problems with Lyme disease misdiagnosis and been billed for the for the for the yeah. the, 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 the honor of that. So so like it's not always the case, but I, I do think that like there needs to. I don't know. I don't know the answers to this, but it it almost feels like healthcare is is an industry. It's a very complex industry because even things like patents, it's, everything is double edged sword. Like patent, of course, the person that comes up with something should be rewarded for that. But then patents also crank up the prices of medications. <laughs> Fuck! I didn't know he was saying patents. I was like, wait, what is he saying? Patents, patents. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden you have HIV prep and stuff like that costing people $7,000 a year. And if they don't have insurance, then they're screwed. And, and like, yeah. it's so, so like, there's a lot of double-edged swords. And, and for me, it fundamentally comes down to feeling like profit within the, the medical industry should almost be like somehow remodeled so that like people who are working within the medical industry, I think should be paid better than anybody in the, should be paid better than rappers, should be paid better than anyone in the world because yeah, they're, sure. they're, 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 they're definitely footballers sports music like teachers, loads of people make more than yeah, like teachers peace officers um firefighters emts uh nurses doctors like th these are the kind of the foundational people in society like I, I mean even car mechanics in a way you know like people that are directly late related their work directly affects the functionality of society these are the, the industries that like really run the society and keep it in tip-top shape and infrastructure plays a part in that too um and then also automobiles and i, I mean you you could i'll i'll shut up i've talked enough but like let's keep going an nhs nurse makes and, and i think that's a yeah, travesty yeah. but like i mean pay I, pay the best you usually attract the best that's always the way that it goes that's all of a sudden jobs that people will strive for that they'll want to dedicate more time and effort to learning because they know that the payout at the end of it is going to be a greater reward for yeah it. that's just you know simple yeah. economics on that one but we just but i think Sorry, go, go on. No, no, I don't want to. <laughs> you go, sir. All right. All right. What I was going to say was, you know, comparing American to British systems, I feel like a lot of your music gives a voice to those underprivileged. Right. And the systematic thing in the States is that, yes, privatized healthcare is fantastic if you have it, if you have the money for it. But there is a large portion of our population that does not have the money for it, that cannot afford it, and that often misses and loses out because it's it's not a section it's the vast majority i mean i'm not not trying to diss Knox, but just to clarify the vast majority of people do not have the money for privatized health care um, unless if it's a health care through an employer in which case some of your pay gets cut and there's a there's a an exchange there that you can get uh privatized health care through that but um yeah the vast majority of people um the it's either you get healthcare through an employer or um like people for me for instance i'm my own employer and i've looked at my health i don't even i don't even fucking have healthcare and that's because it's incredibly expensive for me because i don't have an employer so i don't have like a, a healthcare benefit there um, I make too much to be considered for um, like you have to make actually a pretty like low amount of money to qualify for like public health care. Um, and so in, in, in the area, it, that's the thing. It's that's the other thing. It's a federal program. So they take an aggregate of if you make above this amount, OK, then you're kind of disqualified. Well, I live in an area where it's it's a very expensive and rich area and it's not because i'm rich i came here because i do the trades i i do the trades and so there's more of an opportunity for me to make more here but i do i don't make i make too much for you guys get what i'm trying to say but i'm i'm just gonna shut up and let it go here not have the money for it that cannot afford it and that often misses and loses out because of the way that our system is set up whereas no matter your income level within the united kingdom if you have a serious issue, you're you're going to get seen and you're going to get sorted. That's that's the difference. Yeah, al although it, it's 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 a kind of grass is greener side because we're now so overstretched. If I went in for a mental health issue, I'd probably be on a years long waiting list. And then when I'm mm. seen, because of the fact that they've got like 30, 40, 50 appointments that day, it's a bit of a conveyor belt system. So they're not going to spend right. that attentive care with you. So it's it's there's mm. there's pluses and negatives to both, but. 
to both, I think, but, yeah. But at the moment, mm. because we're in a bit of like a recession at the moment in the UK, more and more resources, and because of uh, post-Brexit and stuff, more and more resources are being pulled out of the NHS. And we're really seeing it. Like, if you end up in A&E in, in the UK on a Friday or Saturday night, it is chaos at the moment. Like, yeah. it's, it's absolutely well, chaos. Well, that's why all the nurses and doctors are now striking, and you've got huge issues with that because they're demanding higher pay for dealing with this, especially the result of COVID and all that. But anyways, anyways, we're, we're, yeah. we're veering. We're getting into... <laughs> A deeper, different conversation. Yeah, what yeah, I want to, yeah. I love, I love that deeper and different though. Like that's my bread and butter, man. Um, I mean, I love, I love the music conversation that they're having, but I also do love like, like the pat, like the, the, the weeds. I love the weeds because the weeds are where you find the truth. And for me, the truth is, is what's more important than anything else. Um, but I, I get what he's saying that they're, they're two music artists now talking about the, the nitty gritty healthcare system. Yeah, I, I get it. You got to bring it back up to the surface at some point, I suppose. I mean, I wouldn't personally, but what I want to bring it back to, right? So you have this moment. That's almost like a, I fucking made it right. Because you're, you're literally on the cusp of mm -hmm. your music career and like really breaking through. You have someone who is successful who believes in you you have a label who obviously believes in you and it's like i'm here and then all of a sudden you get sick so not only do do you lose your your health but essentially you lose your music career and for a, a lot of people right bren that's it like you're not recovering from that you you could spiral out i mean you could get really depressed i've, I've had people that have fallen out of the music industry and yet all of a sudden all these years later Guess who's blown up? Guess who is absolutely taking off independently, right? So persistence fucking pays off. But how do you how do you find your way through those waters, through through those, you know, being so damn close to everything you ever wanted and dreamed for, and then it's snatched away from you? How, how do you keep going after that? Like where where do you dig deep into? I think what it was was it was a, it was a quite a similar time. Um, I was nineteen, I think. And um, so, so one of my best friends who I'd grown up with since I was eight years old, like the sort of mate that you stay in their house for like a week and you're just there playing consoles together, you yeah. know, like, and then like throughout school, we'd like, like it was, it was a year below me, drift apart, come together, drift apart, come together, but always just like mates man, through that. And then like towards the later years, just like got even closer. And then like, so I came back from Bath one Christmas and we were, we were sitting, um, he just gone through a few couple of consecutive breakups and we were sitting in the pub together. And um, this was on Christmas, Christmas Eve, we were sitting in the pub together. And he was like, oh, I ran man. And like, I'm just feeling, I'm feeling super down. But he was like the comedian of the group. He's, he's the one that like everyone just laughed. And he was just like, some days, some days I just want to like walk out into the water and just like, I just want to walk until, until it drowns me, man. And like, mm. but he said it in such like a nonchalant way that we were just like, all right, mate. Do you know what I mean? Like he was just like very less like, because that, that was his humor. It was like quite a dark humor. And then, and then, um, yeah, it was a couple of days later. Um, I get a call. It's like three o'clock in the morning. I get a call from my, my girl mate, Ella. And she's like, Ren, like Joe's on the bridge. He's just phoned me. He's just saying goodbye. He's saying it. He's saying it. Um, saying he's going to jump. And um, I was, I was the closest person who lived to the bridge at the time. So, it's three in the morning, I'm pulling on my clothes, kind of realizing the gravity of the situation. Sure. I, I'm, I'm sprinting up there, I'm dialing, and, and he's, on, he's, on, um, he's on the phone. So I'm like, oh, thank fuck he hasn't jumped. And then like, I keep redialing as I'm, and then halfway up, mm. halfway up I'm, I'm dialing, it's like, this number is out of service. And I'm like, fuck it, you know, get the sinking feeling. Damn. I run up to the bridge, so I come from an island called Anglesey, and there's, there's, a, there's an island connecting the mainland. And, um, so, and there's this big bridge that connects the two, like, like mm. this big, beautiful bridge. Uh, uh, and there's, um, even now when I look at it, it's like, it's taken on a whole new meaning, but I just got there like probably, probably about two minutes too late, maybe. Like just, to, and, and, I, and I was, yeah. So, so like I, I and, and after that, it was funny. Like we never, we never actually found, we never actually found his body. So there, there was part of us for the next oh. 10, there was, there was part of us for the next yeah. 10 days because the currents are so strong there's a cr there's a cross current there, there was part of us for the next 10 days that were still holding on to maybe this hope that, holds on to hope yeah yeah, yeah. We, we were like maybe naturally maybe there's there's a way that he, he went over he's just like dipped he took out some money and he's just like fucked yeah. off somewhere so like for the next 10 days we're, we're like putting up missing posters we're walking up and down beaches with flashlights we're just we're looking yeah. for him and um and, th and then he never showed up and like th there, there comes a point where you have to just like accept that 
the, the Occam's razor, right? The most likely explanation is probably the right one. So like, right. so yeah, it was, it, it was tough, man. And, 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 you know, but we, we, us, us boys back home, it was such a tight knit, like brotherhood sort of friendship with all, all of us lot. So there was like 10, 15 of us who like, we'd be hanging out every day. We, we just came close and solidified. And so really when I started going through my stuff, which was really, it was really, really difficult to deal with, like, you know, losing your dreams, everything. Like I was just like, I'm not, and, and, I, and I used to get calls from Joe's mum crying, you know, early hours in the morning, um, mm. trying to make sense of it all. And I was like, I, I, can't, I can't ever put my mum through this. And I can't ever put my friends through yeah. this. You know what I mean? Like, right. So, so that, that, was, that was mainly the thing. I think it's because I, I knew. I get that. Yeah, I get that. I, yeah man. I, I, I knew what it was from, from the person on the receiving end of that. And I, I don't blame him. I'm not angry with him. Like, he, he did what he did. It was, a, it was a rash decision. I don't actually believe that he intended to. I think it was a call for help that went wrong. But like, I, mm. I, um, I mm. knew what that felt like. And so I was like, I don't really want to ever, no matter how hard my suffering gets, I really wanted my illness to kill me. Like, they, they, sorry to get very deep about this, but I wanted to be absolved of the responsibility because I was in so much pain. I was like, I really hoped that I'd just die. Because then I, yeah. I don't, I don't, I, there's, there's no one, no one has to be like, feel like we could have done more. We could have said this. Cause that's what used to go around in my head. It was like, if I'd have said this, if I'd have run quicker, if I right. would have like all of these things, like uh, would constantly keep, make me feel guilty almost. Like if, if that day when he told me he wanted to walk into water, I just didn't leave his side. All of those things. Like I never, wa and obviously with retrospect, I had no control over that situation. Do you know what I mean? So like, so that, no. that, that, and, and, and I learned that and I went to a lot of therapy to get over that and come to peace with that feeling of guilt. So yeah, this is the first time I've heard him. Uh, um, I'm going to let him go a little bit more, but this is the first time I've heard him really detail um, the story about his friend, Joe. Um, I know I, I did some reactions and a few different things where he would sing about it and talk about it. So you could kind of piece together some context and some of the events um but this is the first time really seeing him talk about like the whole thing um and uh yeah i mean for a lot of people that that thing of um i can't do that to my family or my friends or my loved ones for a lot of people and including myself at points uh that was the final thing that was like okay i can't like when you have nothing like when you're so such in such a dark place that you have nothing left in your head and then you remember you once you realize what it would do to um family uh that can be one of the biggest deterrents in that last moment of um because i've been man i've been in that last moment uh i've i've made that decision to to not you know to cross over to the other side uh before and um by dumb luck i'm alive um it, it was I, i'm not gonna get into it here but by dumb luck i'm alive um and so i i know i know unfortunately in in great detail and it wasn't the only time i had been to a dark place like that but you know it's um I, and something i man i uh i told uh this guy about uh three months ago um not gonna say uh, he's a he's a friend he's he's uh he's he's nearby he's he's associated with me and people that i know and love uh, but i told him i was like look man if you're ever at that point and because i i've been there so i was like i'm just gonna be real with this dude if you're ever at that point think about what it would do to and then i said a few people's names I said, think about, think about, I mean, you know, and especially when there's, when there's kids in somebody's life, like you have to say like, how, like, think about what you would do to this person when they have to explain to so-and-so that so-and-so is not around. Like, I'm trying to be as vague as possible, but like, because oftentimes when you're at that point, um, if, you know, th actually playing it through in your head and saying, okay. Let's say I am officially gone, and I know I'm. Look, uh, whatever. I'm. I'm hogging it right now, and I'm. I want to hear what Ren has to say, but I think this is an important point. Um, you know, actually saying like, okay, let's say I am gone, because for those people, when you're at that point, it's it's not a fucking concept. It's it's I. I know how I I would do it. I know how I'm going to do it. What what like after this? Then what? And then you you know once you think about your family and think about certain people what it what it would do i mean it blows a hole in people's lives 
Um, I mean, I, I had a, it wasn't nearly as close of a friend as it sounds like with Ren, but I mean, I had a friend, she killed herself. Um, and, uh, in, you know, whatever, if that's not the proper language, just fucking miss me with it. I don't give a shit. Um, g grow the fuck up. This is the real world. But b basically, you know, it wasn't as close, uh, of a friend and it wasn't as heart wrenching of a situation either. Uh, to, to where like I was getting a call from her, like it wasn't that, uh, intense. Um, but it blows a hole in somebody's life for sure. Like it, it does, it leads to all those questions like, man, what if I would have said this or said that, or like behaved differently or reached out at this point in, you know, you play through all these hypothetical scenarios, but, um, yeah, I'll, I'll let Ren keep going here. But like... I never wanted to make anyone feel that feeling of guilt that I felt. So that was the mm. that was the thing, mate. That was that, that was that was kind of the the catalyst. Like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, when yeah. I was at my my lowest and and really struggling with a lot of shit, um, that that singular thought I think is what eventually pulled me out was is seeing what suicide did to others. Um, and I had a, a, a really a girl I was really close with, and um, her her father was in the military. He suffered from post traumatic stress. He he didn't do very well, and I'll never forget uh, the conversation when he called her just before that was it for him, um, and Jesus. she was the last person that he spoke to. And just watching that impact on her, and and watching other people that that I've known, and it was kind of like I no matter what's happening, no matter how low I feel, I'm not going to place that burden and that guilt on someone else. Cause I can't, I can't bear to see them go, go through that. I, I don't want to see my family deal with it. I don't, I don't want to see my friends deal with it. So yeah, I mean, to, to, you know, take a darker, deeper path, but it, it, it was that singular thought. I can completely relate to that. This like, just a, yeah. a little bit of light, I guess that, that you have something to now reach towards. And you, and you really feel it, and I suppose it's like, I, I guess you'll relate to this. I, f I think what makes artists is, is you, you really try and understand you from somebody else's perspective. So there's, yes. a lot, there's a lot of empathy involved, and I think that empathy stopped me, stopped me doing it because I really wanted to. Yep. I, I'll be honest, I wanted, a, I wanted an easy way out because I remember yeah. saying to my mum a year into it, I was like, mum, if I have to go through a year of this again, I, I just, I'm just letting you know that there's no way I can do another year and then two years and then three years and then four years. And, and by the time you're just like, and and that's, uh, it was really coming sort of full circle with it. That's kind of with, with high rent. That's kind of what I wanted with the speech at the end. It was, that's why, that's the place that I came to when I first, when yeah. I really started enjoying life again. Like I was just like, mm. you know what? Like, and it's also when the tide started shifting when I was like, okay, maybe I'm going to die. Um, maybe I'm gonna die before I hit 30 years old, but like, okay, that's okay. Like that, it, it just is what it is. Like mm. some people aren't lucky enough to see five. Like, uh, and, and and with that acceptance just came, it was just a relief, man. It was a weight off my shoulders. Yeah. And, and it, the funny thing that almost sounds a little bit morbid, but it stayed with me. And I just don't, I don't. If someone was like, a lot of people are running away from death, right? If some if something happened tomorrow, I, I'm not scared of that. Like, uh, like I'm not scared yeah. of dying, and 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 that that stuck with me since that acceptance. It's just like, but while I'm while I'm here, I'm just trying to make the most of it now that I've lived most of my bed in kind of uh, most of my life yeah. in purgatory, basically, essentially. I th I think what you really appreciate, especially being so close to death, is the value of time, mm. um, and and how. You know, we're just floating around on a rock in space and our time really is finite, you mm. know, so so make the most out of the, the time that is here. Because so many people take time for granted. They don't even realize it until it's it's too late, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. That's it. And um, also this kind of like paradox that I wrestled with of like the, the, there's a liberating. Let me make sure I'm recording. Good Lord. OK, thank God. <laughs> feeling thinking that we are feeling like we are just insignificant little tiny blips in time like if you look at the timeline of, yeah. of the earth and drop a little tiny grain of salt that will probably be the the time that we're alive on this big big scheme of thing as a species but then also as well like that's almost like quite nihilistic is that then that we're also really really important because we are alive right now and we are having this experience mm -hmm. and there's something i don't i don't really know where my spiritual alliances lie but there's something for me quite spiritual about the fact that i am a human being having the human being experience right now so like 
I'm just going to go with the gut feeling of what it's telling me to do, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And so have you ever that experience? Have you ever written specifically about that in a song or is that kind of untouchable for you music wise? Uh, which experience? Sorry, narrow it down. Yeah, I was good. Uh, of, of, of losing you know, one of your closest oh, friends and the, the, the closest, the, the closest thing I ever did was, was, um, freckled angels, but that was more of a homage to him. That wasn't really like, that wasn't really breaking down my perspective of it. That was just what a, a amazing person mm. that I thought he was. And that was, that was like quite, that was very, I, I wrote that, I think when I was 19 and, and, um, it was one of those songs that just fell out onto the paper and I was crying while I was writing it. And I, I sung it at his funeral. Um, uh, which wow. was really difficult to do, you know, singing that in front of his parents. And um, it was just, yeah, I, like, and, and that's, funnily enough, it, that, so the song's called Freckled Angels. The, um, A, my mate, Phil, who, who was Joe's mate as well, he got, he was the first person to get a Ren lyric tattooed on them. He got the whole chorus tattooed down his ribs. And oh, then, um, yeah, man. And then my mate, Mikey, who was also one of Joe's best mates as well, he started a restaurant chain, which is now like one of the most successful restaurant chains back home in Anglesey called Freckled Angels. So like there was a lot of like things birthed from, um, from, from that, which from his legacy, I think, which was quite a beautiful thing. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. I think when you, when you can take someone's memory and someone's legacy and then transform that into something productive i think that's the way that you really do pay homage to mm. them and, and do them justice For you real. know i mean it, and look at the the path that it led you towards and then mm. dealing with all these thoughts and then high ren is born and then we know that high ren high ren is that is the song isn't it that is yeah. really like kind of the official song that took you from like a growing quick a growing well level to just absolutely blasting off into the stratosphere yeah yeah 100 percent. that was definitely i just wanted to mention as well because i forgot this as well which i think this go is on, like, go on. just just to go add, add into the legacy as well joe so there was joe and there was sega and now were two of my best mates and and they were my first actual fans in the world and that was the coolest thing like in terms of yep. hype people yeah because anytime i'd have a song they would be they'd know every lyric they'd sing along top mm. of their voices and actually so talking about belief like it, it, i just completely overlooked that but i'm glad you reminded me like it was that that actually preceded eric believing me was like having my boys like i'd write a song for you. At, at home and like next time i play it they'd know every single word and they'd also be like oh we'd be at a party drinking they'd be like ran play that song you've got to play that song yeah. and then they'd be like singing the top of their lungs and, they, and they'd just be like one day mate you are gonna you're gonna be up there like you're gonna be up there one day and that belief from like your from your boys it's, it's such a yeah oh, fuck yeah like you know my, i mean so important. my boy max for instance like we we would play open mics we would do battles uh then when we started the show circuit on the east coast i mean we would be in like we'd be in the fucking hood right and we'd be like the only two white boys there but it didn't matter where the location was, if there was no one at the show, if there were, you know, if it was full of people, he never, ever missed an event. He was there every single step of the way. And, you know, that that just support and, and that loyalty from it's so the, good. The, the bonds are, are endless, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. Cause I'm like, I like in, in the industry, I'm, I'm always a bit like against yes men, but when it's yes men and it's your boys from back home, even if you're doing something that sucks and they're hyping you up, it gives you the confidence to carry on. So in, in that regard, yeah. I believe in the yes man. Like when it's your mate. You need and that. Just, yeah, yeah. Because it just gives I, you- I think you, you have to have that, that confidence and that self-belief because you're never gonna make it in this industry. You're, you're never gonna make it as an artist because we're gonna hit a wall at some point in time. You know, whether it's external, whether it's internal, there's always gonna be wall. That's interesting. Because, like, no, normally, like, I'm not a fan of, of, like, being told that everything I do is great. But that's an interesting, like, perspective that he's saying, like, in order to kind of propel you into that confidence, you almost, like, need a yes, like, those yes men from back home. Like, I, I mean, I guess my thought, too, is, like, he's talking about the industry as well in that, like, if you have a yes man in the industry, like, a friend you just meet and then they're a yes man – like that's gonna be a lot lot more different than like a friend from back home who's like no like you're 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 dope you know yeah interesting man food for thought balls put in our way and i think it's just persistence you know it's just somehow finding the will to keep going to keep creating content and keep trying to do yeah. your best with that content each and every time no matter your energy levels no matter what's going on in your life 100 percent, man yeah Whew. Well, I'll yeah, tell, oh, yeah. I'll so, tell you what, man. so coming back, coming back to it, because yeah, sorry, I went on a little bit of a tangent. I just want, I just wanted to big him That's up fine. some more, man. I just yeah. wanted to shout him out some more. But um, um, got to. 
Joe Hughes, man, legend, mate. Um, and then, and then, um, so, so yeah, with, it's funny because like I, I've been, I've been building up, I would say, a bit of a cult following up until that point. Like my, my you know, it, it was still quite a modest following, but it, it was enough to be like being like this is going somewhere and, and you know this, this yeah. doing something really really cool with it like because because with with the tales of Jenny and Screech and Money Game and stuff like that, there were little moments where I just have like people really connecting to these things and then but then it was really like it started growing exponentially when I released High Run. that's when things yeah. that's when I was like holy crap you know like this month I've I've had more growth than I've had last year and I'm like in it's the hot. whole year and I'm like what is what yeah. is happening right now like and, and then all these crazy like people coming and hitting me up that are like people musicians that I've admired for my whole life or like actors or whatever and I'm just like fuck me like this is this is crazy it's, it's almost overwhelming to the point of being like whoa do you ever feel like do, do you ever feel imposter syndrome do you ever feel like is uh, the the only time is, the, is this uh, actually uh, happening? Not not so much for in terms of the um because I'm almost quite disconnected from the, the, the in terms of like fame connect uh, and attention side of stuff. Not really because I I I I, almost, I I like it because it's like I've now got a platform to hopefully make my contribution to what I think is a positive change in the world. It, it might mm. it might not be right, but I'm a clumsy human, so I'm gonna try my best. But like my the time that I get imposter syndrome is because it was exactly what I was saying before because I, I, I'm not sure if imposter syndrome is the right word but when I put out something like, like higher end and that's the la that's actually the last thing that I wrote that I've released everything that I'm releasing now is stuff that I wrote about a year or a year yeah. and a half ago two years ago Interesting. so it's like it's not so much imposter it's more just like fuck I wish that I knew that this was going to happen in advance so that the stuff that I'm writing now it, yeah. that, but the, but then this is what I was talking to Tarek about and he's like you're being I stupid because like okay. people are enjoying I see what he's saying because he, he has a bunch of music that he made a year ago and then High Ren was a recent like fresh thing he did and then the, the music that he has made in the past does not match what he's um, the the High Ren so to speak and so he's he's it, that's an interesting internal struggle to have yeah enjoying what you're doing but like that they they love that you know what you're gonna give now and yeah there's gonna be a time delay on it but look all of this is already successful and you've only developed more as an artist you've come up with new ideas new stuff like because I, I was gonna ask you about that and then we just got into other lines of conversation because i struggle with this sometimes too like if i've created something we both know there's a time delay between yeah, of course. creation to filming video to editing to preparing the marketing independently to try to figure out how you're going to push and all that shit. So there's always a delay. It's not like we write it and then it's dropped tomorrow. It right. never, ever happens. But I do struggle sometimes with like having longer delays on my music because I get so impatient with it because I just I want to share like where I'm at, like with my pen game, with yeah. my, you know, artistic level here and now i mean how do you yeah, how do you deal I, with that's, that yeah. that's a whole nother level yeah and, and it's because because i'm mixing it and and, and uh, like 90 percent of the time producing the beats as well um it's it, i i've listened to that song to death as well so when i've listened yes. to it to death yes oh i've recorded God, it yeah. I've known, I've shown loads of people it over the course of the year, and then finally I release it. It's like I'm so like over the You're song. Over it, yeah. <laughs> but it's you so, dude, you don't want to hear it one more fucking time. I swear to God, you're like I want, like I'm sick of going over this shit. Look at Knox, like I, I like you. If you ever try making music, you get that. What I've got to do is, what, and what we've got to do, I suppose, as musicians, is you've got to f fall in love with it again. That's why I like the reaction videos, to be honest, man, because then I'm like, I'm watching it from a, pre a fresh perspective. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, actually, this is like, you, you kind of fall in love with it again. And, and um, there we go. Yeah, and that's, what, that's why I really like it. I, I, I've, I've, said, I've said that a few times, but um, the, the, mm. the only time that it didn't happen, so like, I left my management um, last no it was about two years ago and um no no it was whenever power came out i think well when was, i don't know whenever it was a few months before power came out um there was this long back and forth to get out of the situation and but like i was just like i'm i was feeling so frustrated with the music industry and everything that i was just like i'm just gonna make a tune i'm not gonna think about promotion i'm not gonna do that i'm just gonna fucking make a tune i'm gonna put it out there i'm gonna make a yeah, low yeah. budget music video with two phones and i'm just putting it out there <laughs> and like so and yes. it was so cathartic like i smashed that song out in like a week i like i, I mastered it myself i was just like and then i i was like sam we're gonna do a music video where we're driving around in your car and we got two phones and we're just like i and that's still today to this day that's one of my favorite songs i've ever released man it's just vibey but um but i just like yeah i just like I put that out there and 
for me, because there was no delay, because there was no promotion, and there was no hype up, it was just like, here's a song. Like, I really, and, and it's done quite well, ironically, as well, but like, I was just like, uh, yeah, I, I, that, I really needed that. Uh, but, but ever since, mm. so all the, basically all the songs from the Sick Boy album, I knew I was coming to Canada. I knew that I would be here for up to mm. a year. And I was like, I don't want to just like disappear off the face of the earth. I'm really glad that I thought like that because I didn't. I hadn't even written High Ran by the time I was thought, thinking about all this stuff. So if I'd, if I'd have just dropped High Ran and then been like, and now I'm out for a year, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, basically, you you have no buzz to keep going and I, keep the wheels turning. I suppose I would have missed an opportunity. So in a way, it's good that all this stuff's there. But Maybe. I almost wish that I, you know. I I do go back and forth on that because there is like. If if you dropped High Ren and then you disappeared for a year, and then you dropped a song, I I think that people would come right back to it personally. Like as as a big fan of that song, as a big fan of a lot of different Ren songs now, after doing all these reactions and and getting put onto him, um, you know, I think he could have. You know, I mean, that's my personal opinion. Whatever he t decides to do, you know, that that's your decision as an artist, as a person, whatever you want to do, really. Um, but I, I do, I do think that if an artist put out like a massive hit and then waited a full year and then like, I mean, look at Kendrick Lamar, he'll dis he'll disappear and then he'll drop an album out of nowhere. And you know, it's, it's just a classic, you know, let's keep going. But there was just, a, it's the perfectionist in me that was like, oh, I wish I was hitting them with some more like stuff that's like the, the caliber of like the, the tales of Jenny and Screech or the money mm -hmm. games and stuff like yeah. that. But like, I've, I've written something now cause I, this album was only going to be 16 tracks, but now it's 17. It's because I I saw the response to High Run. I was like, I'm writing a song that like stands up like this. Uh, and um, so it, 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 I've said this on the streams before, so I can say it again. Like, so it's Money Game Part Three. I'm not going to go too much into what it is, but the concept for the video. Oh, is so this was before. Yeah, I've seen that. Got yeah. Damn, it it definitely stood up to it. I would say. Yeah, with that one take music video, man. Or two, well, technically there was a cut in it, but... Well, live, it's dope. The, the lyrics are my favorite lyrics that I've written on this album. And yeah, I'm just really excited because I was just like, I need to step up to the mark because I feel unworthy. Yeah. I, I was I Basically, I was just like, I feel unworthy of all this praise. So I need to make something that, that, that like, that, that was it. So that's, I suppose that was the imposter syndrome. It's like that feeling of unworthiness because you're like, I want to release something that... Like if, if people are throwing out compliments that I feel like are way above my, my thing, like mm. fucking Shakespeare or whatever, I've got to really step up my game to even like start like <laughs> reach slightly yeah. reaching for that. So like, I was like, yeah, I'd, I've got to write something like on that caliber. Yeah. But you know, from a non-biased perspective, right? Outside of it being an outsider of your world and, and your box. What I will say is if, the reason people love like the older stuff that you might not feel is as worthy as high rent is because it's refreshing. It, you are, it's, with your one take videos, with the fact that, you know, you can sing, you're gifted playing different instruments, you think about music in a, diff in a different type of way, we know you can rap, so you're bringing a lot of different elements to the table and you're finding unique sounds, you know, introducing the elements of beatboxing and stuff. So compared to, in today's era, when there's just, an oversaturation of the market of MCs, an oversaturation of an artists trying to come up and trying to make it. Like you really stand out with that creativity, right? Appreciate and that, that. creativity, I've always said this, like, sure, like your skills might develop more, you might get better as a writing, your prowess as a writer and all the, the clever things you can do and shit, but what you can't always teach is creativity, right? So you've always had that creativity as an artist and that I think that shines through no matter how far back in time we go with your music, whenever I get requests to do your stuff, like that's one thing I think that makes you so attractable to the fans and why people enjoy listening to you, man. I appreciate that, mate. Appreciate that. I saw an interesting uh, quote somewhere. I, I can't remember where. Let's see if my memory serves me right. You were talking about, because this ties in with your CNN shit, which I think is interesting. Um, Desensitized. Yeah. Hypersensual, can I speak today? Hypersensualization versus D. Save me here. De Desensitization versus hypersensitization. Desensitization. Oh, Why can't I get those words out right now? I'm, I'm tripping up. Yeah. Desensitization. You're versus a rapper, Knox. What the fuck, man? That's hard, though. De desensitization versus hypersensitization. I think those are the words. It's hypersensitization. Yeah. With it's a mouthful for sure. In the world today. And I think. Uh, the CNN moment actually really encapsulates uh, the walking be between the two. But anyways, 
would you like to speak on that a, a little bit more and kind of how we have to deal with that as artists and how we sort of uh, approach it with our music? Yeah, I, I think uh, that it it's it's difficult. I think I think I spoke about this in uh, an interview years ago. Actually, it, it's very it's difficult um, because I think we're treading a line where because we're so sensitized by the news, by the media, by clickbait, mm. by everything that like, and we all fall victims to it. Even like with, with hyperpolarization nowadays, it, it feels like it's every year it's getting a little bit worse. So whether you're sitting on the left or the right, wh whatever your views are on abortion, on vaccinations, on like all these like very like emotive topics, right? Mm. Like there's, there's my, my thing is what I really want to do is, is, is be a voice of mediation between two polar extremes. And it doesn't really even matter what I think about them. I don't think so. I don't think it really matters where on the fence I sit. It's more just like, how can we have a healthy conversation? Because, okay, taking a very controversial topic like abortion, for example, on one side, people want the freedom and domain over their own body, 100%. 100% they should have the domain of their body. On the other side, someone thinks that you are condemning a life to death and that's also very valid. You know, like at what point is that put? And so th this is the thing, there's two very, very sensitive and difficult topics on either side of the spectrum here. And right. we've made it so we're in an echo chamber with our hands over our ears, shouting at each other and not listening to each other's opinion. So it's like, how do we find a point of mediation that feels right and that feels like mm. a good conversation where even if I'm on the far right and you're on the far left, we can sit in a room and we can go, ah, oh, I understand you and you understand me. It's why I love that. Do you remember, remember that join the Lucas, I'm not racist video? Yes. Beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. I thought he was doing exactly the sort Beautiful of thing. Beautiful storytelling. Just, just yeah. the, the, the end of that, like so poignant, man. And I think so. I hated the hug. I hated the hug at the end of that video. Um, I mean, I understand the sentiment of it, of like, you know, we can come together in this and that. But for me, it was it was too. And I've, I've talked to a lot of people and it, not that it matters, but people of many different races who, who many different. I've talked to black people, white people. And, and the one consensus I did get from some some of them was that they did not like the hug. I personally did not like the hug because I think it was an oversimplification um like a very like i i mean i think about it like i'm gonna call you the n-word a hard er and then you know then we're gonna hug two minutes later for me it was like there, there's a lot to reconcile there i don't know like it, and i i i did think it was a phenomenal piece of art and i i i uh like like not to shit on it as a piece of art but i i personally didn't like the hug at the end of it um, I thought it was a great dialogue. It was brutally honest. And, and, and um, you know, I, I mean, I thought it was relatively representative of like the, the two camps, like on a general scale. Um, you know, you could find like little nuances that you could disagree with or pick a bone with. But b generally, like relatively accurate as far as like narratives go. And then um, I just I did not like I want to see if they mention the hug at all, because I, I personally did not like the hug. So many people love that video because everyone's craving that deep down. No one wants to be, come away from a two hour long Instagram argument, like on the comment section. Yeah. We've all done it and we all feel gross after we've done it. Yeah. Even, even if you've like, yeah. even if you've like schooled them and put down some opinions, you don't come away from that being like, <laughs> I'm you're skipping down the street like I feel great. You, yeah. you just feel a bit heavy and like I feel like everyone yeah. really feels like that. So like finding these points of mediation and in terms of hypersensitization versus desensitization, it's like we're so hypersensitized because we've been trained to like have these really emotional visceral responses. Yeah, get knee off. jerk reactions to yeah. everything online. And but then yeah, we're, we're also paradoxically really echoes. Exactly, but mm. when we're paradoxically hypersensitized because we're shown so much violence, we're shown so mm. much like. It's, I'm, not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it and my, and my music does the same thing but we are so subject to like so much information from the internet these days that we can see anything you, you can watch someone being beheaded on uh, online if you search like enough and it's just like it's yeah. it, we're so desensitized that it's like so as an artist because we've seen so much um you, people are either going to get really outraged or they're just going to be completely apathetic and it's like to yeah. be a, to be an artist in that environment is is an unusual it's, thing because it, you... it's wild. And then you have like CNN, ironically using hyper polarized clickbait mm. to talk about the dangers of you know desensitizing children and young teens on TikTok. So Beautifully there's that juxtaposition irony. of that right there.
UFO. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what they're referring to. Maybe you guys could let me know in the comments what I exact instance. I don't know if, if Ren was on CNN or if they were talking about a specific segment, but ho maybe I'll get some more info here. You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously I covered it. You covered it. But yeah, I mean, again, how, how, so how, this is how the world is right now. And it is crazy. It's like one extreme to the other. So how do you, how do you find that, that common ground to bring people together through the music? Very, very quickly, it just popped into my head as well. Then I'll answer that question. The um, Go on. the the other thing I think that we're facing is attention spans because we're we're creating so much short mm. we're creating so much short form content that that's why I think everything is yeah. And again, an antithesis to that a fucking nine minute long music video with only one location. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like you're fucking crazy. Like what what is wrong with you for doing that? Like, well, that's mostly, that's the thing. And, like mostly mostly piano as well. Like not a whole lot of uh. I, I mean, not not to speak bad of the instrumentation, but like uh, what he's talking about, yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean yeah, like you're fucking crazy? Like what what is wrong with you for doing that? Well, that, that's the thing, and I, it's like I, I want to do something like that because they're doing it in cinema, and music music isn't as being as ballsy. That they're, they're doing it. That there are some scenes in so, in some um like there were some really good scenes in Better Call Saul. I, I don't know if you watched that, but it was I, I, mm. the reason I liked it was more subtle than Breaking Bad. But there were some really like drawn out scenes mm. and i was like i love this because it's so like it's so human like this is actually real life. yeah whereas yeah like almost like pulp fiction where there's just like conversations about w what a quarter pound in france is called and it's this casual conversation and there's it really has nothing to do with the plot whatsoever but it's drawn out yeah interesting and i know he's a fan of tarantino um but yeah that that attention span is definitely uh uh, I mean, I don't know what the long term effects of it are like, like having these very addictive things like TikTok. I don't know what the long term effects are on a person's psychology. I would imagine it's not great to to have a constant stimulation and a dopamine like like release or like a, a fix. I don't know the technical terms for it, but I can imagine like the like when I when I go on like uh, I deleted my Twitter recently, but like when I'm on Twitter, um, I noticed that like I, uh, by the end of it, it's almost like my brain is more anxious. It's more scrambled and I am more reactionary, um, after like, like from before going on it to after, like I'm, I'm more, uh, I I'm less in control of my brain in a way. Um, and so I would imagine I've never done TikTok, but I would imagine TikTok is, uh, probably a very similar, if not, maybe even more pronounced, um, and even, even YouTube too, like, I don't, I, I don't like, like, or these like two minute reads, like CNN puts an article out. That's a two minute read, uh, which is an interesting thing that they, you know, they're talking about C CNN talking about, you know, I, I don't know the details of it, so I won't go on about it, but like a two minute read, what are you learning in, t in a two minute read? It's like two paragraphs. Like what, what are we learning? Is this even first of all, is is every little bit uh, factual? Are you changing the language in a way to to like make it seem a way that it's not like like aside from all that um, a two minute read? What are you learning in two minutes? That's why I, I do like long form content. Um, but the short short uh, short content is also very addictive and it's it's easy to get sucked into. I think anyone is susceptible to it. We're being we're being like fast food food like swipe swipe video swipe border this one next one like the same with music. You go into a Spotify playlist and listen to ten seconds ago. Nah, not my vibe. Next song and it's like yeah. So what what I is the that, antidote guilty. to that? But then guilty. um yeah yeah. So so I think we were also battling that as well. Partly. Yeah, I mean, re reaction channels, for instance, like when I started my channel, the only channels I saw were short form content, you know, people making faces, maybe they'll say a couple words, and that's it. And all of a sudden, I come in and I start breaking down shit for like 20, 30, sometimes 40 minutes. Yeah. And I have so many people commenting like, I got bored, I clicked off, you pause way too much, you talk way too much, but I just kept doing it. I, I didn't yeah, listen. Yeah. I'm like, I think there's going to be people somewhere out there who are going to appreciate this. Yeah. And the more that I kept growing, the more that that quality kind of started to find me. And, you know, we've we've kind of slowly grown and continued to grind and, and climb from there. And it seems, yeah, there's there's an audience for it. Yeah, but, that's why know, I love those fighting, fighting the ADHD generation now as somebody with <laughs> severe ADHD. And I'm um, also as well. The um, I love those. Uh, do you watch Lex Fridman podcasts? 
He's like an engineer. No. Ru- yeah, Russian no. oh, eyes. They're so good got as some, well. Got something you got to recommend to me, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. They're re- they're really really good. What? Um, yeah. What is he? Sorry, Lex Fridman. That. That to me. Lex Fridman. And I think it's F R I D. F R I D M A N, but yeah, he's really good. He he did one with um with he he was one of the lucky people to uh, get Kanye in the midst of all of that controversy. Um, on really? that, that's that's a very. Oh, I bet that's one. interesting. Yeah. Should we um should we shoot on a new, on a new um? Yep. Yep. Link, really? Looks like we'll do we'll do we'll, one more. We'll I'm just do, do one, one more and wrap it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, how how do we do that as as musicians? How do we find, you know, that that common uniting ground in such a hyper polarized world of team choosing in one side versus the other side Mm. so i think it's about i think it's about being careful about the subject matters so something like high ren right is it's not really saying anything too far on any one side of the fence we're talking about Mm. humanity we're talking about the inner critic no matter who no matter who you are whether you grew up rich in poverty uh in an area of great privilege in an area of great prejudice like we we are all victims of ourselves at, at some point mm. in our lives and so that's find, a great quote yeah and to, to find a point of common ground is just is a, an excellent place to start building a bridge and i think that it's crucial that we start to build those bridges in any opportunity that we have because i think that hyperpolarization it's the enemy of truth because mm. all of a sudden you don't know what's true and the truth is actually become secondary as less important than us being right and our opinions being right. Yeah. And, and when that exactly. happens, when that happens, we suffer because um, we should all, I think ultimately on the left, on the right, whatever, we should be striving towards the thing that makes us the most comfortable and also that ensures the greatest possibility for a comfortable future for the survival yeah. of our species that should be an over you know like i was saying about an overarching theme of an album and and like this yeah. is this is what i want the sentiment to be i feel like in any decision humans make that should be the overriding before before we make an example it's like it's like trickling down you know like you know like first principles theory elon musk works a lot with that it's like you break it down until you get to the very the very like most purified part of the source it's like yeah i feel like the most purified overarching thing should be like how do we with these decisions is this going to make collectively the human experience better in the future Mm. and is this collectively going to ensure that we have a longer future and survival as a species and um and so those questions should really come down come down to every question we 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 make uh, be it pollution be it um what we're doing to the natural kingdom be it any of those things to, to look at it not in a biased way because there is a lot of bias in it and and, and they manipulate so much data even stuff like humans car- carbon footprint you do some digging that was actually pushed by the oil company to make human to make the individual away from the oil company feel responsible for the fact them polluting the planet rather than these big oil companies right so like th- there's a lot um i think that any time that these decisions which i the thing is with my song like money game about realizing the hypocrisy of it all when you step back i also know that i'm a contributor of this so it's like uh, and for me to point the blame at too many places is actually me being a bit of a hypocrite so it's like how do we create a system whereby um because ultimately say say this this company this big corporate company becomes the biggest corp company in the world yeah they get all the power they 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 are the top they can make all of these big fundamental decisions that trickle down through parliament that trickle down through governments and they have ultimate power F- what then what then if the, the future of the human race is screwed right. because we're 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 messing up the habitat that we live or, or or if we're making decisions that aren't based on how can we improve our future as human beings and i, I think like fundamentally Every decision that we really need to make has to has to ask that question first. I mean, not not the point where it's exhausting like every little micro interaction because we're gonna, we're clumsy yeah, beings. We can't live perfectly. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm I'm glad he's clarifying that point because I'm sitting here thinking like, well, couldn't that easily turn into like an OCD mental illness where somebody is constantly questioning every little decision about like if I go for a walk, I'm gonna exhale carbon dioxide. You know what I mean? Like, is it gonna yeah, but I'm glad, you know, glad he's clarifying some of this because it's, because um, that is that is some of my critique. Is it like, 
uh, well, it, it's a much larger issue than I want to get into right now. Right, it's exhausting, like every little micro interaction, because we're gonna, we're clumsy beings. We can't live perfectly, like, and we never will. Um, yeah. But but if we kind of make that the main narrative between these big decisions, I think we're doing ourselves as a species a great service. Really do. Yeah, yeah. but I mean unfortunately there are a lot of selfish people in the world there are a lot of short-sighted people that whether it's because of fear or greed or other circumstances they just kind of get tunnel vision and they focus instead on the future of our human race yeah kind of the here and, and the now so my, so my question which i've never been able to answer it is uh is it nature or nurture like is greed an inherent mm. biological human behavior or is it one born from our environment and are, are those things inseparable is our environment there because of our inherent biology it's a very difficult question it just keeps on going back it's a chicken and egg question um so it, it, yeah but i think because well i yeah that that's kind of a deeper philosophical question but for me it's like well regardless of the origin of it and i understand like if you can determine the origin then maybe you could figure out how to fix it that way well bottom line it's still here here now you know what i mean it's like it's like so if somebody had a childhood trauma and then they grow up and they're 25 now and they go to a psychiatrist okay they figured out the source of the issue end of the day that still probably caused things and you're having serious mental health symptoms how do you you still have the same issue to deal with regardless of what the source is and i'm not saying don't ponder the source um at all like i'm not saying that but i i do wonder like there is a lot of like like pondering you know whether it's like oh like pe I've, I've heard some people say like well people are just fucked up like people are just fucked up um and i'm like well maybe but there's there's also a lot of i've met some really great people like i i consider myself to be a, a pretty damn good person um I, I'm, you know, like Ren said, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect and nobody ever will be. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, there, there are, I mean, there were points in my life where I would not have described my, myself that way at all. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's a very large, it's a very, I could talk for a while about this, but let's just keep going. Question. Here. Um, so yeah, but I think because I feel like this very strongly and I have for my whole life, I feel almost a responsibility to try and relay that within the music that I've had. And I feel like... I feel what, what the... Why is there music playing right now? What's what's going on? I feel like music... You know, the story of Tro, uh, Tro, uh, Trojan Horse, the story of Troy. I feel like music's such a good Trojan Horse to be able to deliver your idea of, of, of what you think is good. And... Uh, and coming back to this hyperpolarization, I like that concept. Mm, uh, com coming back to this hyperpolarization thing, I think that like everyone really deep down, we just want to feel happy. Like we we just want. Quick question to ask: If it's a Trojan horse to be able to deliver what you think is good as an independent artist, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. However, if there was a larger entity that controlled what was being said couldn't that same musical artistic form be used to potentially implant bad ideas bad intentions in my opinion your favorite rap your favorite rapper sucks in my opinion it's in a way commercial music has done that and i don't necessarily think that it's to brainwash people I think it's simpler than that. I think sex sells. I think drug sells. Violence, excite, it's, it's shocking. It's exciting. And I think that sells. I do not, I don't necessarily, like, I, I don't know that there's any proof that the intention is to brainwash people. Um, is that possible that that happens? It could be. Um, but it, once again, it's like, how do you prove the intention of something? It's like, well, you have to have some kind of a proof or like solid evidence that there was an orchestration to, to like push out a certain con anyway, that's kind of like a separate issue, but it is something that I think Ren is, is exactly right about. And the way that that's done is the, the, inf like the influence of music. Music is such a powerful thing. Everybody listens. It's probably the most popular thing in the entire world. Um, aside from maybe sex, 
and food and water and sleep. I think probably music might be the fifth. Um, just because it's such an influential, such a popular thing, and it it strikes some kind of a spiritual chord with a lot of people. So let, let's keep going here. I I could I could deviate and go down the rabbit hole on a few different things here, but let's let's keep banging away. I want to feel good, and and it really frustrates me when I take a bird's eye view of this and being like we're we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot by this constant like me versus you i, I and we really yeah. we really drill that in with with elections we really drill that in with because everyone's trying to push those emotional buttons and these politicians are talking about topics that they know are going to get people riled up because that's how you get support that's how you get more um support in the poll so it's it's really like for me it's like how do we how do i as an artist try and offer an antidote to this where people can step away from it and feel the humanity and not feel this like constant clash in polarization because well it, especially too trying to be independent which means we already have so many factors and odds against us we don't have a huge marketing team you know we we don't have a lot of the assets that a label artist has so how do you stand out and there's definitely that temptation and that pull to go we'll give into the hyper polarization sure we'll give in to be super controversial you know and that's kind of diluting your own message in a sense then because it's like well now you're using this hyperpolization to promote your own music but yet you still want to critique that's I, I, well i'll, I'll listen her take it and do that so it's a hundred percent man it's why i like you know so so coming back to animal farm like you know the the the, the um the, the story where they they overthrow the humans because of, they're sick of the inequality but then mm. but then you have you, you have an overthrowing um uh, then creating a hierarchy of corruption within that. He, I think he, uh, if, uh, it was a while ago that I read it, but he let, he lets the horse, who's like his most loyal like servant, a friend, he puts him down because he's too old to work, and it's like it's just yeah. gotten it's gotten so corrupt that 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 it's yeah. just uh, 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 and and that's the, that's the thing, and and that's that's the thing that terrifies me is that like you're you're kind of working out as you go because I I can see that there's something inherently wrong, but I'm so nervous about the biological nature of humankind that i'm like what what's the solution what have i got to offer but maybe oh, so he's he's trying to figure out whether it's a lost cause so okay so he's trying to figure out is it a symptom of the environment in which case maybe is uh there could be a solution but if it is simply nature um because that is the animal farm concept is the uh 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 ultimate what is it uh absolute power corrupts absolutely um and so that is uh, yeah i don't know that's that's a tough one um yeah anyway let's let's keep going i because i don't know i'm one i'm one person all i can see all i can see is fault and i think that's why when it comes down to like these songs like money game like the overall sentiments of, of the of the chorus when it's like point the mirror at ourselves it's e it's easy to point the blame but we're all part of it and and it's like that noticing Absolutely. that in myself and being like you know i'm not i'm not somebody with the answers at all and and that's quite a scary prospect for me but i also just think there's a lot that can be said for just coming back to the the good in humanity the, yeah. the, the, and, and, well, and you, you you don't have to know all the answers in order to see the problem mm, yeah you don't have to have all of all of the solutions and i think there's there's an empowerment especially from your music and taking that accountability because then that makes people connect with you more because it goes you know yeah i'm i'm human like mm. i'm not standing here on a soapbox speaking down to anybody i'm no. speaking to us all equally and i'm not even i'm not even necessarily criticizing ways of like because a lot of people have been like yeah but capitalism works right and i'm like I, i'm not an anti-capitalist i actually i actually think that money as a form of trade is a good idea and i, and I think that right. in, yeah. i think that in there's a reason why money was invented i mean yeah yeah, yeah. And, and i think you know. that in, i think that proportional incentive to work obviously it, it's become com complicated and you could be argued that it's not proportional but I, I think that having incentives to work harder or to make yourself more ambitious that capitalism makes Nothing sense wrong with that. yeah exactly yeah. so so it's it's not even so much anti-capitalism it's just more just coming down to like it's really just because i think all of these systems can because even like communism on the surface sounds like a good idea and then in its actual practical applications it sounds like totally a great, it sounds like a great idea uh, like on paper it, it sounds like a phenomenal a phenomenal fucking idea on paper
like just totally <laughs> run with and um the, the, the examples of, of functional communism haven't been great like you look at the look no. at the past do you know what i mean no. so and, and i guess they, i guess the difference is that capitalism and communism in terms of ideology fantastic ideas for human and societal systems mm. right Humans then intervene. <laughs> the We've problem never is gotten a functioning form of communism. We've totally yeah. fucked that up. Yeah. You can blame Stalin and Lenin for that. But anyways, that's a different day. Mm. And then uh, capitalism, we at least got a functioning mm. system from it. Mm. But still, humans have found ways to mess that up as well from yeah. its original I'm ideology. A, I'm a, I'm a, I, I know I'm pausing a lot, but for me, blaming blaming like as any specific individual for why a system fails is not i mean it could you look at a system and point at one individual who carries a high amount of the blame and say that that's why that person failed i mean with to some degree of accuracy i'm sure you could do that um but for for i don't know interesting yeah i don't know yeah i'm just here too like trying to soak up the ideas because i mean at this point now they're talking about very large ideas and and uh, you know, th this is kind of like political science in a way, uh, not in a way. It, I mean, that's kind of what they're talking about. Um, and then there's also e economics, you know, that they're kind of like, they're kind of like brushing the surface of a lot of this stuff. Um, I'll just play this through, man. And I don't think that's necessarily the fault of the system. I think that we like to try and simplify things too much and go, yeah, but if you don't think this, then look at this. Like, like, yeah. like the, the second you criticize somebody, someone goes, yeah, well, this if, if this doesn't work, look at the alternatives. And it's like, it, it, it's more about just making these things quite fluid, really, and, and just trying, mm. to, and trying to think about better ways to do things through collective intelligence. The, the internet, again, is a tool, double-edged sword, but it, it, it's positivity that it can... Um, like gift to the world is that we are now more cut, like interconnected than ever and the power of collective intelligence to be able to make like very clever democratic decisions using the smartest minds now using ai like of our time to to make decisions that are aren't based on it's i think when when it's like a profit-based decision i think that there's there's pluses and negatives to that as well but when it when it's based on that overarching principle that i said to you i think that we will would benefit massively from that as a, I know it's a, it's a very like sort of utopian sort of mindset, but I think there needs to be people that think like that sometimes as well. Like it might be a little bit, oh yeah, the world's not that lovely a bit. I still think it could be, man. I do. You're an idealist. Yeah, of course. You're an man. idealist in a, in a real world, but yeah. we need more of those. Honestly, if more people thought that way, I think this world would uh, be a much better place for it. And it, it also sounds to me like, I think when you're hit with this philosophical dilemma and you start really thinking deeper about the systems under which we operate, you, Ultimately, you have, well, let's call it three choices. One is you just bury your head in the sand and you just keep going and just stop thinking about it and just function within that society. Two, you go against it, you rebel against it, and you try to change it externally. Or three, you, you accept that you are just as flawed as the system is, and then you try to find ways to change it internally. And it sounds to me like your music and kind of just your persona and outlook towards life reflect that third option of, you know, it, I, I, look, I'm not trying to burn down every single bridge here. I'm trying to find the positives in a productive way for us all to thrive as a society and move forward and just bring us together and, and think about our future and humanity and the human race. Yeah, it's a, it's a point of mediation because if, if people start to mediate and collaborate and use collective intelligence, like I don't need to have any answers at all because we've all got them collectively. Like people's mm. people's problem solving skills are amazing. Um, it's what it's why like dur during the big what's it called? It's like Voldemort, the, the the thing that must be named during the pandemic when when everyone was so hyper polarized about um the vaccinations. Again, it it, it it was the same sort of thing. And 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 my opinion on that doesn't really matter where where I stand on it because I th I think that both schools of thought there was a lot of merit to both schools of thought uh, uh, that what i found really sad about the pandemic was i think it was a real opportunity for us to go as a species we are here unified yeah. in the force the, in in this you know it's like independence day where the the, the aliens yeah. come and we're like right we've got a real opportunity to regardless to of, unite, unite. We've, we, we've got to overcome this situation somehow yeah, yeah this like, is a this is a global situation it's not going yeah. away anytime soon and i think what was really heartbreaking for me about that is that the hyper polarization that it birthed towards the the fallout and coming out of that was mm. quite extreme because because i think that the, the the narrative of of where you stood on the fence with the vaccinations and um 
a lot. It like defined your entire character. Mm, and, and, you know, and, people uh, made judgment calls based right. on just your feeling of vaccination, no vaccination, mass, no mass. Like that was that was like your identifier. It yeah, and, and you know, I also wonder how much of this was in in person. What, like how much of what they're talking about was people online saying things about other people like camp a saying things about camp b and camp b saying things about camp a like i mean this was during the pandemic so i wonder how much of it was like in person like hey take that fucking mask off you know what i mean like i, I i'm sure there was some of that but I, I do wonder like how much of this was like real conversations between people or was this like uh, well, and, and to Ren's point as well, I, I think there was a beginning phase of the pandemic where there was that uh, kind of a unification of sorts, I sensed anyway, um, where there was like, a oh shit, we as a species, we have this thing, like we don't know. There was a, a point where we didn't know if this thing could wipe us out entirely. Like it, it w there was a lot of uncertainty about what it was, how it was behaving, what it is, what is it going to become? Um, and in those inis initial phases, uh, there was that uh, with that uncertainty there. I feel like there was an initial thing. And then at some point it, it, there was this political thing that that happened again. Um, and yeah, I mean, wh wh whether like whatever you believe about vaccines or like um, like, I mean, for instance, I, I, I did look I, I, personally, I. I was very curious about this virus because I one because I lost my job due to it. I was laid off and a lot of people were laid off. And uh, fortunately, I, I didn't come on too hard of times and I was able to make it through that. I was very curious about the origins of it. And I, I mean, it, it is interesting because <clears throat> it is like the it's the chicken or the egg conversation, in my opinion. It's like if, if what I'm trying to say is. If you have, let's say, if you have the left, the whatever that even means. First of all, I hate using the terms liberal, conservative, left, right. These are such grand terms. I, I think they immediately when you start using them, I think you have a start having a terrible conversation. But for the sake of what I'm trying to say, if you are, if, if you're on the right and you see uh people on the left uh, some group of people on the left and they do something that you interpret as in, as extreme or i mean each side believes the other side is going to ruin the country so like you have this interesting thing where like in for, i've talked to a few different people and they say at least in the states it started kind of in the 90s where there was a separation um, but you have this separation and then as one side becomes more extreme, more vocal, more outspoken, then the other side sees that and they become more scared. And then you have this classic tribal thing of of each each side is now counteracting to the other. And so the more extreme one side becomes, the more extreme the other side feels they need to be to counteract that ex perceived extremism. Um and so you have this uh, that's kind of like a different concept, but that's something that I've noticed is that like, how do you stop that cycle of of people who are looking at the other side and saying, oh, we need to fight this. They're going to ruin our country. And then and then and so like we need to do this to save our country from those crazy people. And then the other side looks and says, oh, my God, these people are saying crazy things we need. To, and then like you just have this constant um thing and and the result to me in my opinion is people start to scream louder and there's even less conversation in real life um part of my problem too is that a lot of this is is taking place online like a lot of this isn't my in-person interactions with people w when i start when we talk about politics or or like uh, even just like a specific topic there my conversations with people are actually really great um, I've talked to Trump people who, uh, by the end of it, it starts to get more reasonable. I've talked to really, like, really far left people who, by the end of it, we start to, like, reach a ground where it's like, like, uh, like, fuck what my opinions are. It's like, when I have the in-person interactions, those tend to go great. And I actually find a lot of people are just sitting in the middle while these two sides are just 
fucking becoming more inflamed. And then the like the a lot of I, maybe even the majority of people are sitting in the middle who are like, I'm not going to pick a side. And then that infuriates both sides, because if you sit in the middle and you say, I'm not going to pick a side. Then you have a right winger saying, oh, then you're you're basically being complicit in communism. And then if you say I'm going to sit in the middle and then the left person is like you're you're being complicit in fascism. It's like, how about fuck you both? Let's just have a reasonable discussion anyway. Point I'm trying to make is I wonder how much of this toxic hyperpolarization if we sh if the Internet got shut off today. If there was an EMP and it blew out the fucking internet, what would happen to that hyperpolarization? Because I think a lot of this shit is happening online. And, and I think a lot of it, like the things being said online are real. Uh, but I also think there is a, a potential for a bad actor, like say a country who would want civil, like, like a civil war in the U.S. potentially, not accusing any nation in particular, but like you would be able to make an account. You would be able to say some kind of inflammatory thing and spark some more outrage and just just stoke the fire just a little bit. Um, and so I wonder how much of this shit is just online and people are not people in the real world are not fucking communicating with each other. I do wonder that quite often because every time I I take the risk. And it's, it's especially a risk because I run a business. And so occasionally, not not often, but occasionally with customers, I might just like lightly like just just like get a feel for them and then maybe have like a, a like a light conversation. Nothing serious, but they're they always tend to be great. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm banging on here, but uh, it is a serious it is a serious point that I want to make is we talk about, oh, my God, people are more angry than ever. And some of that is true in real, like I see some of that in real life, but the vast majority that I see of it is on like Twitter or Facebook when people, human, a human being is not interacting with a human being. There's a human being sending something out into the great beyond and then another human being is reading that thing and then these two people are starting to hate each other because of something that was said without any context, without any inflection, without any in-person interaction. I'll shut up because I know I could bang on a while about it, but I hope you guys understand. It's hard for me to tell whether or not people will understand what I'm saying, but I'm sure a lot of you will. Um, let's just keep going here. I, I'm, I'm just, I, I got to pee. Let's keep rocking here, guys. All based on just your feeling of vaccination, no vaccination, mass, no mass. Like that was, that was like your identifier. It yeah, and, and I, I'm, I'm just, I don't think, I don't really think. I know this is quite a bold thing to say. I don't really think it mattered where you stood on it. I think that the most overarching thing was more like, why is this dividing us so much? I think that was the most yeah. important thing that people weren't really talking about during that time. Yeah. Um, like what, why, like, uh, and and it was because it, I think that that was a real opportunity that that we maybe missed out on and, and I okay i know i just went look ronald reagan also said something really weird uh about aliens so i'm not i'm not gonna talk about anything as, except this he said that if an something along the lines of it if an alien race invaded us humans would come together and so i think what would my guess is kind of what happened with COVID is that initial phase where a lot of us were really scared because we had no clue what this fucking thing was there were questions about where it came from, even though I won't get into that part of it. Like, <laughs> I won't get into that part of it, but there, you know, we were unsure of it. And so there was this existential threat, like this, this outside threat potentially threatening humanity. And so I think you saw a semblance of coming together. And then once we found out, like, Okay, it's it's similar to the flu, but it's it's it can be a little worse for some people. Like like once we found out that it wasn't gonna like you're not gonna die in twenty like you get it, and then it, it once we found out like you're not gonna die instantly, and that it wasn't gonna wipe out humanity, and then we kind of adjusted to that. I think that's when the vaccination stuff started. That's when you had a lot of the like. Um, fighting about where it came from, who's responsible, why why are we in this situation? Like, that's when I think a lot of the division started to come was once we realized that this wasn't going to wipe us out and this wasn't going to... I mean, even if it wiped out 25% of the pop human population, 
I think we would have been a lot more communal and and it didn't wipe out 25% of the population. Um, it nothing, in fact, not even really close to that, but, um, y you know, I, I think once we realized that it wasn't going to be as lethal as maybe we had thought in the beginning, I think that's when, um, you know, you started to see that division, but we'll, we'll keep going. I, I would hope that we would, um, make the most, maybe it wasn't bad enough because the way, the way that I see it is, is like... <laughs> <laughs> see i'm not fucking nuts um make the most maybe it wasn't bad enough because the way the way that i see it is is like you, you keep on taking cookies out of the cookie jar like yeah. you're, you're, you're ren said it ren said it not me not me ren said it gonna eventually be like oh where's the cookies and and, and i feel like we're we're really like we're getting to a point now where there are natural things that are happening there are the weaknesses in our infrastructure as a society are becoming more obvious and and it really needs to become a time where we're like it, it's like prevention is better than a cure there has right to be a turning point there, there, there has to be kind of a prevention point, is better than a cure but i think it. yeah prevention is, yeah. is better than a cure but i think that we're so like mono focused that it's probably going to take something quite it's going to take the cure it's going to take the it, cure absolutely there's quite... no way we're going to do prevention the, I think the rate we're, gonna... we're going and, and it's sad but i think that it's going to take something that's going to make us suffer quite a lot to the, the the positive of that there's there's a um line in the red hot chili pepper song that goes destruction leads to a very rough road but it also breeds creation love that line yeah. but it's, but it's, I, f I feel like it, maybe this is a bit of like an ominous like prophecy but i feel like we we um maybe we'll need to go through something quite severe yeah. for us to go yeah. uh, we need to start i'm i i know i'm pausing it a lot guys but there's this um it's it's kind of an 80 to 100 year and there's a lot of debate within historians about it but there's an 80 to 100 year period where there's a massive conflict there's peace there's acclimation and then there's a social change away from convention and then eventually what happens is a large catastrophic conflict or a, a pandemic an outbreak and then people will go back to kind of conventional and communal and and then you have this cycle and um, there's debate as to how many it's usually uh, the numbers I've heard are uh, usually about four to five generations, um, which would be, I don't know, 50 to 75 years ish. Um, World War Two is 80 years ago. So I don't or yeah, in, in that ballpark. Um, God, I, w I wouldn't I don't like I would never want anything but but I happen to agree with Ren here in that uh, th when when there's a peacetime and there's an extreme amount of comfort, you seem to have this division. Um, and there's also another saying that what what is it? It's something simple like uh, hard like hard times make hard people. Uh, hard people make soft times. Soft times make soft people soft people make hard times um and it's talking about like you know like uh the great depression and then you know you have world war ii which is you know creates some hard people uh they create the soft times post world war ii and then the soft times create soft people which really would be us um anyone who's lived you know since the 50s base you know since 1945 but you know since the 50s more or less um soft people then create the hard times you know the implication kind of being that it's war again um i happen to agree with ren that like i don't believe that there's a i don't believe there's like a diplomatic solution or like some kind of a mass therapy or like a new i don't i don't think there's like a new way that we can all look at things to really bring people together other than what history has told us, which is some kind of major catastrophe. And I am not religious, but my God, I, I do not want that to happen. Um, and I don't even know that that happening would be worth the people coming back, you know, being communal again, because of the, the reason people become communal again is because of the amount of pain that is caused, see, uh, seen and experienced by the population. And so it's like, man, is that even worth it? Or is this just a cycle that's going to repeat again? Like we, we are living in a time where between technological advances and, uh, you know, 
general peace. I, I, would, I mean, like, no major world war. Then again, you have a few things going on in the Middle East. You have Russia, Ukraine. So I understand all that. Um, and that's part of my concern here for the fucking record is, like, uh, um, I won't get into it, but I, let's keep going, man. I'll just listen to these guys talk because yeah, I'm going to get myself in trouble. Not that I like I, I don't have any problem with anyone taking issue with anything that I'm saying because I do um, I do believe the things I'm saying for sure. Um, and I don't take issue with that, but I just don't know how many people are watching this interview reaction to listen to me fucking talk about a World War Three scenario. You know what I mean? Let's keep going. Well, I need to go through something quite severe for us to go yeah. we need to start working together we need to start focusing on what's important which is our survival i agree and again looping back to the hyper polarization every of everything you have a situation like this that should in theory unite us and bring us together against a common enemy and have a common goal but instead all this over sensationalization just divides us further yeah and you know we're social media can be a beautiful thing this interconnected world can be a beautiful thing. It can also be a very dark thing as well. And, you know, there's always pros and cons to everything. So going on to, to social media and the question I'm curious about, because, you know, being an artist myself and dealing with a lot of these things, uh, unfortunately, I could tell that you are an overthinker uh, and uh, you you go through a lot, a lot of these concepts. Uh, you go through a lot of these emotions. Obviously, you empathize with a lot too. being an artist. How do you deal with this? more introverted mind right and probably nature of of putting a lot on yourself overthinking all these things and yet you have to exist and your job is putting yourself out there all the time yeah. and being incredibly extroverted and also normally you know like we're doing interviews right now and stuff it's not like you could come on this interview and you might be thinking of some deep shit and you might be a little down and you can't sit here on an interview and just be kind of like this and what's going on guys and i got a new song today you know what i'm saying like yeah we, we almost have this polarity amongst ourselves as artists because we have to be incredibly external yeah while a lot going on internally i mean how do you how do you find balance to that force i guess the, the, this is what like, one of my favorite bits of advice that i ever got and it, i can relate it to this cause, like it was um back when i was really ill and i was um it was the first time that i'd i was i'd i'd, I'd gotten myself kind of well enough to be in Brighton, but not well enough to really leave my room. But I wanted independence from my mum. Um, uh, not in any slight, because I think my mum's amazing. I think that like what she put up with, like she is one of uh, a force that I'm so grateful for in my life to like be in there to house me and, and look after me when I was really sick. And she, she saw me go through my worst phases and she was really dead. But, mm. but there was a point where I was like, you know, for my own like spirit, I needed my own independence. And I got, I got back to Brighton and I was living with this guy, Ben, who's this amazing guy. Um, just like really creative, but works in theater. And I was like talking about like, oh, you know, I want to get on the street and do some busking again. But I was like, I've been, I hadn't performed for so long that I was like, I just had performance anxiety. And I was like, I've never had this Ben. Like, I was like, I, I don't know. Like, I'm just so nervous about getting out there again. And he was like, he was like, when I, he just gave me this advice and, and it can be applied to situations like this. He was just like, it's you are, it, it's almost like, it, it sounds depreciating, but it's not. It's like, you're not really important in that, in that scenario. The important thing mm. are the people who are watching you or the people or the message you're trying to give away or a feeling. If you're trying to make people happy, which, which your, your song as well, mm. um, then it's not really about you. It's not really about you need to stop thinking like how am i being perceived and, and you need to start thinking about is that person having a good time and and i think when when i yeah. when you take the lens off yourself and i stop worrying about me how i'm coming across if i'm going to be oh if, if if something i said was clumsy or not because if i start thinking like that it's just i don't know it's it's really self sabotaging so i think it could be applied yeah. to social media it's like even on days where i'm like oh, i don't feel like promoting my song today i'm just like it's i i think that it's more important that especially now that there's like even more people watching like if i'm serving a lot of people and making for taking like an hour two hours out of my day to chat to you to to post something on facebook to share a song to do something like that that might even just to reshare something that i've repurposed that i've made like a year ago like and somebody sees that and it cheers them up then like that small action that i've taken has impacted a lot of people um maybe superficially, maybe quite profoundly. I don't know. I don't, I'm not really in control of how it happens, but thinking of that as more important than me, 
and what I've got to gain, that really helps me with that because then like, mm. I'm just like, and then also it makes, it has this paradoxical effect of making me feel better anyway because like today I was even mm. like, I woke up and I was like really foggy headed and I was like, oh man, I've got to speak for like a couple of hours with Knox. I hope I don't come across like a twat and I was just like, yeah, it's, th th then I've got to remind myself. I'm just like, you know, it's, this is, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like, it's, it's more, it's more important that, yeah. that just, yeah. That's, that's it really I'm not perfect at that mate like because I still have days where like I'm dreading doing something and, and even while I'm doing it I dread it um, right we we all do we we all go through it man trust me you know like I, I gotta put out content every single day on top of being an artist you know being a reactor as well so I have to bring my energy and obviously I've created an expectation level because people expect me being at my best mentally processing things as quickly as I can, yeah. concising down my analysis, giving it to them, pitching it to them and, and doing it in that way. And yeah, I mean, you know, so many days where I'm like down, but I, I think you're right. That's, that's a great fucking point and sentiment. And I think for any artist out there watching, uh, it's not just about us. No. It's about the people that are here now on this journey with us and this community that we're trying to nurture and, and build. And, you know, that is one of the, you know, we're selfish, okay? As artists, we're selfish because obviously we, we want attention. We are attention seekers. We we want to play to the high, largest crowd possible. We want as many people to hear our music. So there's For that sure. selfishness. But at the same time, we're incredibly unselfish as well because, well, artists that really want to have a message that, empowers people that want to leave a positive outlook and try to leave the world a better place than how we found it because we want people to walk away with something better something different i think i think what know? a lot of people can't relate to in this this position as well like you're in my position is so so sometimes say like I'll, I'll i'll look through my my instagram inbox or message inbox or whatever and i'll get a message and i'll it'll be a message i haven't seen for a year and then another one and it's like you're so arrogant you haven't replied to me um, and it'll just be like abuse. And I'm just like, or, or someone, and, and I'm just like, pe what people don't realize, I think in, in our situation is we have to communicate with people more than anybody else. Like there's yeah, right, literally yeah. today, if I look through my like 24 hours inbox, it's like, there's, there's probably about four or 500 messages from different people. I'm probably going to look at about 1% of that. But when people start yeah. like demanding your attention, that's, that's when that's, that's, I get a lot more overwhelmed than that with the, trying to put out content. It's just like, cause I'm just like, Fuck you! I'm just like honestly, that's how I feel because I'm 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 just a little bit like you don't understand what it what it means to be like I'm trying to like give so much of myself to uplift people and then people are like you are not giving me attention. I want your yeah. attention because I said something and and even though I'm I'm always appreciative like of a nice comment or something nice that's being said to me and I try and read and respond in the best way that I can but I, because there's so much of it I wouldn't have any time to make music if I was just a people no. communicator do you get me No so, what they what what they watch right. you for it, it's ironic cuz what they critique you for is it's the same reason why they watch you like if if all of a sudden i spend all of my time to responding to every single message on this inbox right respond to every single email and just you know every other fucking place that people are talking to me i'm not going to get time to make content and no, the whole point it. is people want to see the content and yeah, to yeah. me you know it's it's more efficient because when i'm at my best making this content people get the greatest enjoyment and i can reach the most people well, that's the, out of it that's the thing you're you're going you're going you're actually going to make e even though but but you know saying saying that i do i do try to every now and then when when i can but yeah i think that's, oh, oh, that's, oh, oh, that's, oh me too me too i like i i always try to set aside time to respond and actually when i'm at my lowest that's when I really turn to like kind of the inbox and, you know, scroll through the mean and all yeah, the hate because yeah. that just comes with the territory. But then, but then you get those amazing comments, you 100%. know, that just like yeah, remind yeah. you and center you of why you're doing what you do when you can just inspire like that one person and have an impact on their life. And you're like, yep, that's exactly why I'm fucking doing what I'm doing. And then you just Damn, keep going from that's there. That's real. Yeah, for real. Can I ask you a question? Because, <sighs> Go on. so, so, because I'm always really interested about this because, you know, so cause, cause if, if, if same thing, if you grew up in like a poor area, because you you strike me as someone like very like with your analysis. Yeah, you see you seem like very, very well educated. And I wonder if that is that f comes from your self-inspired desire to learn curiosity. Would you say your knowledge? I've, I've, I've always been curious, but all right. So the, the thing is. From where I'm from. One of the things that always kept me out of trouble compared to like some of the kids I grew up with that are now either dead or in jail was besides music, I also had sports. So I was oh. also an athlete. Yeah. So I was I was a really good athlete. I was good enough that, you know, I was offered scholarships to go play at university. So I got to go pursue a higher education 
thanks to sports. But that always kept me out of trouble. It kept me focused. It gave me something to do. And then actually, ironically, when, when I got hurt and had a really bad injury, that's when music really saved me from that darkness. Because all of a sudden, I was doubting my future and my career on this side of things. But I've always loved music. I've always created. I've always read a lot. I've always written. So I, I think it's a combination of, of education, but also just curiosity. Like I read every single day. I, I'm always studying. I'm always, I, I'm just so curious about the world. And there's just so much. Man, that is one thing I watched. I, I don't watch much Knox, but, and I'll, I'll let, just let this play out. But uh, I watched one and I was like, hold on. There was some shit he was bringing up. And I was like, dude. Like, did you pre-research this? Because how, like, if you just have that sitting in your head somehow, uh, I, I mean, it, it was unbelievable, his his amount of knowledge and, and just, like, the way that he was able to link things together. I was like, God damn, dude, second to none. Like, like big props, but I'll just let this play out. So much to learn and not enough time to learn it. Yeah, so yeah. So I think it's a, I think it's a, a combination nice. of those things. Nice. Does that yeah, make sense? No, yeah, I was, I was, just, I was just interested. Yeah, I'm like I'm like that. I'm like I'll open the fridge and I'll be like, "How the hell does this keep like <laughs> stuff cold?" And then I'll just like Google yeah. it, and then I'll just be trying to figure. I, 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 but that's it. And then yeah. and then you were gone on a fucking scientific journey yeah, after that. Yeah. That that happens to me all the time. Like I I have so many notes and so many things like trying to remind <laughs> me to stay on track because I do I do struggle with that. It's so easy for me to get curious about something and yeah. then we are on a journey. And hours later, it's like, what the fuck was I doing today? <laughs> You're like, you're like, oh yeah, just be standing by the fridge for 20 minutes. So, oh, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> dude, dude, I'm sure you have plenty of moments when you're like going to do something and then you have a different thought or maybe an idea or something creative happens and like you just totally forget what the fuck you're doing. And oh, then, like, yeah. No, yeah, no. <laughs> like, like my, my wife will walk in and I'll have like something in my hand or like something spilling. And she's like, what the, what are you doing now? And I'm like, I don't, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, man, that's the story of my life, mate. <laughs> fuck yeah, man. Listen, man, I think uh, I think this is a good ending point here. Honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you, man. Is there uh, is there anything you want to leave with with our audience uh, to to sign off with after after our wonderful mental journey and musical? Yeah, journey? well, don't know. This, this is this has been a good one, man. Um, no, I, I think the thing the sentiment is, it's, I think it's the first time I spoke about um, like really the details of everything that happened with Joe. So I just like to dedicate it to Joe, man. Like he's one hundred percent, man. I think that's. Sure. Um, well, yeah, that that's that's it really, and, and also another a really close friend of mine, Callum Mackay, who's well, he passed away six months later as well. Just just very set for different sort of circumstances, but um, yeah, like like the, those the, there's there's people that I'll always carry with me, um, that also made me who I am as well. So like, uh, yeah, a lot, yeah. A lot of things that I and they're always here, and you know, even though you haven't written about it in their music, they're still with you in every single song that you put out and everything that you do. And yes, I'm mate. Sure they're wherever they are man they're they're happy for you yeah i hope so man i hope so bad. respect man all right man thanks a lot all right man yeah i'm wrapping this one up too hopefully you guys enjoyed it if not uh, i don't know leave a negative comment or something but uh yeah i'm gonna wrap this one up peace out